jet ski, um, whether there's almost like a water. Um, but it's a great competition. Uh, I don't know how much it is to join. We got a little thing down at the counter downstairs. You scan it, um, it'll bring up all about it. So you're welcome to scan it on the way out and just lock it in your phone. I think this year it's about 100 bucks by now. 100, it's only about. 100 bucks, yeah. is it? Yeah, it's only around yeah. about 280, I think. Or 325. Right. 325 last year, was yeah. it? Last time, sorry. Early bird, 325. Yeah. Yeah, okay, there you go. So it's only yeah. a bit more. Yeah. Going, in saying that, I know the sponsors have sort of slightly pulled back a little bit to suit what's happening but generally speaking like we don't we've normally sponsored big time as well about 10 grand with this stuff but um when you got the uh the, the thing set up on the, in the park um you normally get around about sort of probably three to five hundred dollars a year in your bank as, as part of your joining fee but that's for your team not just for one person plus you get all your meals um every night there's nice meals and uh, and a great atmosphere and, and things to drink and choose a fad about where they caught their flatties. Um, but uh, when it's online, it's a bit quieter. <laughs> so, yeah. But I think this year they're still doing a bag because they're a bit donating stuff as well. So they are doing some sort of team bag, which would be good. Yeah, anyway, so we'll, enough of that. <laughs> but uh, it's called the Sport Fish Club Run, okay? Which is a great uh, club. Okay, so Stewie is go and I'm going to share our secrets on uh, on casting. So, oh, not casting, not soft plastic, sorry. We'll be doing the next one on casting hard bodies, but Tonight's all soft plastics, soft vibes, soft prawns, and uh, and soft plastics. Um, flatties, uh, the best thing about flatty fish when you're using soft plastics is that um, you just don't know what, what the next cast is going to bring you. It could be a little fellow, or it could be nearly a metre. Um, and which is the best thing I like about flatty fish, it keeps me casting all day long, because you just don't know. And, uh, and being prepared for it is what we're trying to make you guys aware of today, and understanding all the gear, um, Unfortunately, we'd, we'd go fishing half our boats full of all the gear, but you don't need that much. You need to cut back and just grab your six favourite soft plastics, a couple of vibes, and uh, and obviously your hard bodies if you want to do trolling them. But that's in the next seminar. But um, an array of size jig heads to suit the conditions where you're going to fish. So you need to know what you're going to fish, where you're going to fish, depending on the wind and the current and the tides. It's really important to understand on that day what you're going to do. So, I don't know about you, Stuart, do you, you get everything ready the night before? Do you know? I, I get know. everything ready the night before. So when I'm in the boat or the morning of, I just want to get out there and... We've all got limited, we mm. all work. So mm. you can't be out there every single day, you need to be ready and you need to make the most of it. Um, that's why if you ring Doug or I either, um, we don't answer the phone, <laughs> we're just efficient. Um, but the biggest thing is you need to have a bit of a game plan, have a look at the tide, see what the tide's doing, try to have a start point and a finish point, and in between you try to work your spots in between that. You don't want to zip one end, like fish the seaway on the high and then, I don't know, fish the seaway on the half way, run out and in between fish a pin bar. There's no point. You're losing too much travel time, but mm. um, I don't know, what are you, what is, what's yeah, your so thoughts? I, the first thing I do is I look at the tide and then I look at the wind, and, yeah. the, and I... When you, get, when you do a lot of float fishing, you, can, you have, especially if fishing competitive in a comp like the Float Classic, every 15 minutes of the tide, you need to have nearly three different spots that will work. And it all depends on the wind, that's why I get three different spots. So if it's blowing and howling nordly, I need to fish, obviously, um, out of the wind if I can. Um, and last resort, if, if, if you know the fish aren't going to be at that stage of the tide, then you need to troll. But um, generally, if it's blowing south, I'll go that area on that same 15 minutes of that tide. Why I say 15 minutes is because a lot of time you only get one or two flatties and then that's it, they'll just disappear. Um, sometimes you can work a place for two hours and pull 20 flatties. And like in, in a good session, um, like a good four hour session, I've had my two young boys out, Jack and Liam, and, and we easily pull 40 flatties, you know, and that can be anything from little ones up to 80 centimetres. But, um, but generally speaking, it's like we went the other day, two weeks ago we went out in that terrible weather, it was like peeing down rain. It was about 10 degrees, I felt like it. <laughs> we were soaking wet and it was only about 25, not subtly. And we pulled about 25 fish in that terrible conditions for about three or four hours fishing. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Everything just kind of worked. Hard. Yeah. And we got yeah. like you know, 280 plus and, and a lot in the 50s, 60s and, and probably only around about 10 unders. So, yeah. well, not even six unders. But, um, and then we went out again last, or oh, Tuesday this week, and we, it was hard going. Um, we <coughs> decided to fish the flats rather than the deep. And you got to decide it before you go fishing, whether you're going to fish deep water or shallow water. If you're land-based, you need to decide on the tide, obviously, um, where you're going to fish. But 
um, we decided to fish the flats and uh, lo and behold, a couple of boats fished the deep and they're in the deep. And then it was about 15 or 20 still for about five or six hours fishing. And a couple of mates ended up with 30 or 40 for that period, but they're good fishermen. So, um, I'm not, has anyone caught like a 30 or 40 day float out session? You have, mate? Well done. I've that last three years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, today, we're hopefully we can get you to do it, but as we keep emphasising, it's really about planning. You can't just go out there and throw your line out and throw it on the sandbank and hope to catch later. It doesn't work that way. You know, you'd be, you might be lucky with some of our customers have over the years and got big fish and just out in the middle of nowhere. We'll be, we know where to go, but we just, sometimes they're not there. <laughs> they're probably out on that guy's paddock when they catch them. But, um, but preparation is a key, as we spoke about. Yeah, so um, I was, would start with my gear. Actually, you want to start with your gear, Stu. You can talk about your gear first. Yeah. And I'll go down for down scales. So my gear, because Stewie's got his single guy, you know, money yeah, comes in. Disposable income. And he can buy <laughs> higher gear. When you see my so, gear, you'll think, oh, this yeah. guy's got 10 kids. Now, I can say that, like, Doug and I always have a joke about how much people, well, we all spend good money on gear and you get the best that you can afford at the time. But I know Doug uses rods, rod and reel Very combos odd. that are like under 150 bucks, and so do I. It's Once you get That's a rod a that you like the feel of, you just use it um and like that's a classic example i think that costs about 150 bucks type of thing plus braids so about 180. um the real dougie had on a clearance sale back in nin street for 40 bucks and that was eight years ago Dougie. yeah it's about that. Right. and it's still going hard it's called fish to like 92 centimeters type of stuff and it's just a proven performer I like the feel of it. Not everyone does, but um, it's one of those things. Yes, but the other day we in the boat. I was in Stewie's boat, first time I met in Stewie's boat, and he had those there, but he kept them around this one. I'm going, yeah. oh, I wouldn't be doing that, but anyway. That's right, it's the cheapest <laughs> one, but it yeah. just feels good. But, mm. so I take, I always take a minimum of four rods up to about six, um, depending on what I want to do and how I want to do it. But um, for the cast in scene, I'll take, like that's my lightest one. Yeah, yeah. So that's just a Loomis. I think it's two to six pounds. It's fairly mm. light, but a very fast action. So you don't want to make like a piece of spaghetti. Reason being is if you look at the build of a flatty's mouth, it's all bone on the top up um, jaw. So when you feel a flathead eat it or uh, eat it on the scene, you might feel it. That next jig, you've got to set the hook. So you've got to use a sh it's got to be a sharp, thin wire hook, and you've got to try to penetrate that bone. So everything's fairly stiff. Um, in the cast and stuff. Mm. So that one there, I run three pound braid and I run six pound leader. So it's light. I've never had one chafe me off on it because um, it is lighter. You just fight the fish a bit harder, uh, a bit lighter, sorry. And don't angle with the rod tip up. Try to run it down water level because then you're not pulling above, like against the teeth, you're running the lure out front. So it's you got to angle the fish a bit more on that one, but um, if the bite's really hard, we catch a lot more fish on light gear. And then my next step up from that one is that one there. So I run six pound on that one. And um, similar setup, a little bit shorter, and that's my quarter, like, getting back to the gear I'd use on it. I use that one for weedless prawns and like what, up to about a quarter nothing above, it's just a little bit too soft, you lose a lot of action in it. And then a little bit stiffer rod, so this is my next step up. Um, that one I run six pound on, 10 pound leader, maybe a 12 pound, depending. Um, and that's like my quarter and three eighths rod, one of them. So I always run a couple in that bracket. That's the biggest bracket that we use. Um, fishing up to say seven, eight foot. Um, but most of the plastics fishing that we do is kind of in two to six foot. Mm. Just working drop offs or up on the edges of banks um, and up on top of the bank when it's a high tide. And then these are my two heavier setups. So this is the heaviest that I have for platties. Um, and I just run six pound on these with, I've got a 16 pound liter on one and a 14 on the other. And that's the same thing. So I'll use that in deep water or flats fishing. Um, they're both really stiff, 
And um, that's the same type of rod that we'd use to snap a plastic offshore or jewies or any of that type of thing. But as Stu said, his line's only six pounds. So um, I generally, I used to use 15 or 20 all the time. Now I use sort of uh, 10 down to six. Um, many reasons. Um, one is um, casting into the wind, if you do have to cast into the wind. Two is um, if you've got cut current and flow, your lines, you're in touch with your line much better. It doesn't get pulled by the current. So being really thin, it's very direct. You feel yeah. everything, you feel every tap. When they tap, it's generally when you've got a fish on, right? Yeah. So, and that um, deep water stuff, like mm. you can be fishing 60 foot, like up the pin or anything like that. And um, you don't have that big belly. So whereas if you're using say 20 pound or 30 pound, even some guys use, you've got a big belly, you might need to go up to an ounce head to get to the bottom. I can fish a half ounce and you get a lot better feel and I think it results in a lot more mm. fish, like better numbers wise. Yeah. I'll, I'll show my gear now. Yep, let's see Doug's gear. <laughs> yep. Now, I'll we just got all of Doug's I'll, reels back from I'll, Shimano I'll, service. <laughs> I'll sound bar okay. I'll so embarrassed to bring my gear in because it's when I'm at the front of the boat, everyone that drives past, they go, Doug, get that reel fixed. It's like, <laughs> yeah. but I catch fish, so it doesn't matter. But, <laughs> but it's so noisy. So I said it's got to Stu, I said it's to Shabana to get more serviced before I show you guys, like, so you don't hear any noise. <laughs> see, this one's a bit noisy. But anyhow, this is my sort of light outfit, it's a little um, straight CI4, the old one, two and a half thousand, pretty worn out. Um, I think that braid there is around about six pound as well and that lead is about 12 pound um i do use 20 pound in, in the deep water yeah. like stewie's saying but um probably i do have one that has 20 pound on it here somewhere um, my next one is a um this one here which is a light um oh it's got no spool <laughs> was um, i was halfway through putting the line on it downstairs oh, and that, it's that, still downstairs oh thanks <laughs> anyway okay. we're putting six pound on that one so it's very light yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very light uh, Zodius rod. It's the lightest one they do. Um, I think it's a six pound, or Stu's put more six pound on it. Um, and that's a little sustain. I like little sustains so this last a long way. Not a long time, but they're pretty expensive. But the old model one. Um, my next one is another Zodius, but just a bit heavier one. Now this one has got 20 pound on it, but I use um, a braid here that's so thin. It's so thin I can't even see it. I must have forgot to bring it here. I did have it, I think. Anyhow, it's, um, I'll show it a bit later, guys. But it's a 20 pound um, YGK braid, and it is about the thickness of most six or eight pound braids. The braid that you guys have in there is the same brand, and some of these have eight, some have 10, but it's as thin as any four pound in any other brand braid we carry. It's extremely thin. So I want you guys to get into, I know it's a little bit expensive braid, but I want you guys to get into understanding how good it is to use thin line, okay? So that's why you get high quality line. Um, that's the important part about getting a lot of fish. And that so, allows you to fish a bit heavier and you don't lose that sensitivity. Like all my braids, having said that, they're six, but they are the older stuff and they're thicker. So all that stuff, you can run like 15 pound in that brand that you guys have got. And it's probably thinner, if not, well, as thin, if not thinner than my six. But, um, yeah. You guys fish live baits often? Yeah, casting I use, um, these are my, I'll show that rod, those rods next week. Um, they're a bit heavier rods, and um, I do use 20 pound. In that same YGK stuff, it's like 8 pound um, in the line. Yeah. Um, but these are all my soft plastic type rods. Why do you go heavier on flats? On flats? Mm. Um, a lot of the big fish are on the flats. Um, more than you get the fish off as a big fish in the deep too, but um, I don't. I this is as heavy as I use, but this is my deep rod. Yeah, I don't know. It used to. Yeah, I, I fish fairly light on the flats, really. Yeah, yeah. Deep water, I'll always fish heavier, yeah, slightly heavier. Like I'll use that three pound stuff or six pound on the flats, and that's about it. Yeah, Stewie does what yeah. I don't do, and that's he's a six pound lead. I would never use six, I sort of start at maybe 10 or 12. Um, I don't go any lighter than that. And maybe when I'm trolling down, um, before I get to the a little bit of heavy lead at the bottom of it grown, so like 17 or 20 pounds, as yeah, a bite leader, because I inhale the lure right down. But, um, but, but generally it's a lighter lead at the top, a lighter lead here. So this one here is, um, I think this is 10 or 15 pound, which is my heavy outfit, so um, I'll use that in the deep as well. But this, the rod's an old Loomis, um, shaky head, a great rod. This thing's called... Cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah it is. There's so, yeah. mm. I reckon this is a cool from um, if it's, <laughs> it's a bit chewed up. Not from a dog, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's probably got um, 10,000 flavours on it. About 10, years old. But it's a great rod. Um, one thing I did notice about Stuart, he ties his... I use the loop knot on my, on my jig heads. I like to use the loop knot about smaller than a five set piece, about the size of my little fingernail. That's as big as I'll go in the loop knot. Um, Stuart ties his direct. Yeah, I tie straight on. I don't even cut the tag on it. He doesn't no. cut the tag. I don't <laughs> know. Don't I'll go, I'll, I had to get a pair of scissors out yeah. to cut his tag. I still cut the tag. Yeah. It's about a centimetre long. I just leave it on. doesn't yeah. worry me. But my so, theory is, I know that Doug's theory is the loop knot, you get more movement, it's a mm. bit natural. But um, I always believe, because of flathead fishing, we'll go through the action soon, but I fish quite fast. And I think if you've got a solid eye and like a soft loop on it all day, I've had cast off so I've lost fish because of it and a break on that weak point on the on the um where it's contacted the jig head or anything. We'll like check that. your not set. Yeah right. Um, so but that's probably a downside for fishing light leader too though. So that's a bit of a maintenance thing. You gotta I, keep an eye on it. I'm just gonna cut off Stuart's sorry Stuart, I'm gonna cut off your jig here mine. This is what we used just a couple of days ago. Um, and they caught a couple of fish so mine's a bit shaved to feel it. Um, and so is Stuart's. Yeah. And you'll see the difference in the two knots that we're talking about. Should be a pair of scissors just there. Somebody. Can we cut it? That one is supposed to help because it's sharp. Let's make sure you draw it back. So these, um, these plastics going around, they're a fuse bait, I think. Yeah, I'll pass it around too. I think yeah. you got the you got these in one your bag. You got the bigger bag, size yeah. of that one, and you got that one as well. Yeah, um, and they're really good. Sort of one fifth Nedlock, which is a TT head. Uh, they're quite blunt at the face, and they stand up really good. The biggest thing with platies is I I believe with a standard G head, they always fall on their side, and I think you lose a lot because they go in the platies mouth sideways, and then when you try to set the hook, they come straight out the mouth sideways. Whereas these ones, they stand upwards, and even there's some football heads as well. We've started doing the football heads again. They always sit hook point up. So when you go to like, jig the next year, that hook's going straight upwards. Um, Guys, please don't prick yourselves because yeah, you are passing on to the next guy beside you, okay? <laughs> but, um, it's three sizes here. Yeah. Um, so as, as Stu was saying, it's hard to see there, guys, but they always sit upright. Yeah. And I've always been a big fan of football jig heads. Getting them is hard. The guys, the two guys used to have making them, um, no longer do them, they don't want to do them. Yeah. And the ones we did overseas, which are fantastic, they'll fuse them with the diamond eyes, they're really good, with the orange belly. Um, those tackle have decided to stop making them for some reason or why. Um, so we're back to doing these ones, which are custom made, and we are selling them again. So yeah, they're good, but they sit upright. I'll pass around just a normal head. Well, actually, these sit upright too, because I designed these to sit upright. <laughs> those ones. Yeah. Um, but so those other fuse ones, like how Dougie said, they sit upright. They've actually got a flat, like a, like a plane in plank on the bottom, and they kind of glide down a little bit, and they always sit plank down. So they sit hook up. So, um, so I'm just going to go through the tackle with you guys, okay? So you get the tackle up. Then, then we'll do the techniques last, and where to go and how to do it. But important to understand your tackle first. That's just a standard quite end jig head. These are a um, TT jig head. TT is probably by far our biggest seller. Yeah. Um, except when we've got football jig heads, they, for the guys that know how good they are, they sell a lot. Yeah. Um, but the TT jig heads are, are definitely a great jig head. They're a good jig head and they've yeah. got that headlock system, so they will hold on all your um, elastic type material plastics. So they're quite hard, they're very um, like elastic -y, stretchy. Whereas a traditional old plastic or a golf, it'll just stick to any jig head. It doesn't really matter. But the um, TTs and I think Squid You Buy, Tough, and a couple others, because mm. they're so soft, I would say use the TT heads. They just fit nice, I hope. Mm, they do, yeah. yeah. Oh, it so no eyes. eyes. No oh. eyes are okay. Blind eyes are okay. <laughs> <laughs> Blind jig heads. What's your view on catch rates with mono versus braid? I'm not talking sure oh, about oh. cutting them off or breaking them off. No, no. It's uh, it's more the working of it and getting the yeah. bite. Getting the bite would be 90% worse. Yeah. 100%. 90%. 100%. More feel. Yeah. When you move oh, your so rod, yeah, lower yeah. moves, it's not stretching that mono. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know, for the guys, you guys that catch fish, you'll understand, most of the time, 
when you're doing the, the jigging, um, the, you get two feels. One is um, when, when it falls, you, you just feel a tap. You just feel like a tap. And that's, they're on there. You get a lift up and they're on there. Mm -hmm. The second way they hit, which is one you really love because they're generally good fish, is you do the dunk to dunk up. You drop it down, it'll be like dunk. And that's the one that's inhaled right down. That's about the big. <laughs> and they're the ones I like to feel. Um, and that's the two feel. But if you've got mono, you don't know any of that's happening. You don't know it. It's, and you're not prepared to set that hook straight away, or what it might be. You know straight away it's a good one. So you set the hook straight away. Yeah. But uh, no, if you're using mono, please um, change the braid if you can. Uh, does anyone here only use mono for flathead on lures? No, I wouldn't think so, no. <coughs> um, so leader size, uh, yeah. As I said, 10, 20 would be the max in the deep water, or if you're casting glide baits or, or big hard bodies. Um, and uh, 10 or 12 seems to be a really good average, but you need to check it every couple of fish and trim it and retire. It. It's just as simple as that. Otherwise, you get that good one on, it'll just, uh, it'll just be gone. Length of leader? Length of lead, I like to keep mine really short. I see people, like my, not my son's, my son's mate, uh, we're out the other day fishing, and I borrowed his rod for a sec because um, he couldn't get, the, I had a different fish, I couldn't get a bite, so I said he used my rod. I used his, and I got the biggest wind knot now. What the hell? <laughs> and he had a lead, it was like two rod lengths on, it was around the reel actually, and still the, the lure was out there, you know. Uh, you only need a metre, I use a metre, not even a metre. I don't know, you still do it. Yeah, I, I start off You go a bit longer, I think. I start off with about five foot, and I use it till about six inches to the my tight ass. I don't <laughs> want to retie. Um, but, yeah, I, I use it right up, it doesn't worry me at all. Yeah, yeah. so a metre's a good starting point, because the knot's always outside your rod most of the time when you're casting. But even if you use two rod lengths, mm. it's above your reel. Mm. I always try to leave two rod lengths of leader. Yep. Because um, I know I can do it in all day. Yeah, it, yeah, it yeah, gets down. Right. Yeah, but I yeah. always make sure it's in front of the reel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, an FG knot's a different scenario because you obviously it's clear through the guides and, and you've got time to make it. But yeah. I was going to quickly show you how quick it is to tie a, a, a knob right in a minute. It's so quick. And when yeah. you have to, and I never have it come undone. But you got to know how to do it right. I think. <laughs> I don't know. Stewie doesn't like to. Nah, I used to always tie old rods, but um, mm. I just think the FG is a lot stronger. You can, really pretty, you can get pretty quick with it. Yeah. Yeah, you can actually. Um, I see Sammy Hiskey's got. I don't know, I'd love to know how to do his hands. He's got that, and it's done in about 30 seconds. Yeah, that's <laughs> quick. Nah, oh, I haven't seen that one. Yeah. Anyway, but um, yeah, but you're right. Yeah, if you if you do it FG, it's fine. Yeah. But if you're still an old rod or or whatever, some beauty, whatever, you need to um, I don't have a short. Yeah. yeah, it's you just enough. Know, you go down the way this much and you still get the bite. Yeah. So where's the finesse? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's, that's, that's right. The, the yeah. finesse is in that it. six pound or ten pound yeah. braid. That's where the yeah. finesse is. Yeah. If yeah. you're using fifteen or twenty, I think it, would be, it wouldn't be as attractive yeah. to the fish. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the leader mono or um, no fluorocarbon, hundred percent if you can. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, many many things is that mono has too much stretch in it. The second thing is that the um, the abrasion resistance of fluorocarbon versus mono is about five times better than one, you know. <coughs> Unless the copolymer may be mono, uh, they have a coating on it to make it a bit stiffer and harder. Um, but generally speaking, it's very easy shaped, uh, where fluorocarbon uh, is a lot harder. But the thing with fluorocarbon is when you do pull any knots, you must wet it or do it slowly. If you do it fast, it burns a lot quicker, the, the, the heats up much quicker, and, and it really weakens it. So if you don't do it right, it will. Well, good, my friend. Oh, you're a gentleman. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. Stuart, mine survived better than yours, mate. Yeah. And it's caught more fish, too. You can feel it. Uh, so, anyhow, uh, yeah, so um, just make sure it's after a carbon. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, I think we, I'll just go through the gear and then we'll do the the spots and how to work your spots against the, the current and the wind or whatever. So you, you work out your plastic. So if I'm going to fish the shallows, um, I won't really take, and I'm going to use plastics, not talking uh, hard bodies, I won't take much over about probably a four inch bait, a uh, four inch lure, okay? Um, most of my lures will be around that sort of three inch is what I really like to use. Um, years ago, I was, I was a, even didn't matter if it was that deep or 10 metres deep, I'd use a half ounce and three eighths was my light jig head. Now, I rarely use a three eighths and I use a quarter or one sixth. The action I used to do was quite aggressive, it was 
one, two, three up or whatever and drop back down. And quite fast, like Stuart's quite fast still, yeah. but he does a shorter, shorter fast. Um, but now I find uh, it's, it's more uh, relaxed type, like rim fishing sort of thing. Just a rod and shake. But uh, it's a lot more uh, finesse to, to the elbow. So basing my plastic for suit, suit that um, Having said that, like if the fish are really fired up, oh, it's different faster scenario, the yeah. better. And you just yeah. turn them around, just get through as many as you can. Yeah. But yeah, general fish, and it's not, it's all not always hot, it's not mm. always on, and um, they just slow it down. And, so, yeah, so yeah. generally I'm trying to cast, I mean, the is very similar to it, around about at least 20 metres, if not 30, 25, yeah. as an average cast. Um, preferably up current or with the, it, with the wind, if I can. Sometimes I have to cast against the wind because your boat's sitting that way and the current's coming with the wind. Um, and uh, so if you get that real light braid, those little one quarters, they'll just sink down hard, like a three eighths will definitely slam to the bottom pretty quick. And, but the action, um, I used to do was quite, quite up high. Uh, even I was in shallow, I used to come out of water all the time. <laughs> they get a lot of fish that way. But now, it's, it's the technique, I don't know if the fish are used to that sort of style, and everyone's doing that sort of style for a while. Um, it's changed, and, and now it's just a little like that. I hardly lift it more than high off the bottom, but I'll maybe go up and I'll actually just, the last part, I'll um, sort of teabag it, it. Yeah. but mid height, off the, it's not on the bottom, it's actually off the bottom when I teabag it. So what I'm doing is I'm sort of not lifting to the bottom, I'm pulling it forward along the bottom, just off the bottom, if that makes sense. So it's sort of swimming along. And then why do you give it a bit of uh, So, different again. So Stuart, if he shows yeah, his technique. I, I shake and wind. Oh, actually that one is. Yeah, uh, that's right there. Yeah, it's gonna come through the guides, but that's right. Yeah. So I'll, um, like I'll throw out long cast as far as I can, and then I'll kind of shake the rod and wind and probably about a turn, so that's moving about 80 centimetres on the standard rip. Otherwise you lose feel, you can't feel that nip. No, no. that's right. But Doug on the other hand. <laughs> Very different, <laughs> but it works for me. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But if you can try and master it, do it because it works. <laughs> um, I'll cast out, I'll let it sink to the bottom, I always watch my braid. It's, it, you watch it on the surface, it stops, it's hit the bottom, right? Um, sometimes I will wait a little bit, especially if it's coming down current, so I believe it hits the bottom, the fish will come straight up. As soon as it starts rolling with the current, they'll sometimes just sit on it. You get a lift and that's that fish you've got straight on, it's already there. And that, I haven't done anything. Uh, but if I, if I hit the bottom straight away and then work it straight away, I don't seem to get that, that first fish on straight away. So that's one little trick. Um, another one is, um, I'll, once I've done that, I'll just do my little lift up and then I'll drop it back down. As I drop it down, I spin the handle. Oops, can't do it because it's caught a bit. I'll just spin the handle like that. And it goes, thump, and it actually pulls it along, and that's the secret. That is, have you tried that yet? Please try it. <laughs> and, uh, and you'll feel like a thump like that, and you're on, you know, and it works so much. <laughs> yeah. It does, it does. Yeah. You always hear, you always know because Doug goes like, it's always like, and then the spin and it goes, and it goes, and that's, he's got a fish on. Yeah. 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 The coffee so, grinder noise definitely makes a difference, yeah. I think. They don't even bolster the They're coming up for a morning They're break. silent now. They're yeah, silent. Right. But um, yeah, so this lifts up a little bit. I drop it down. As I drop it down, I just turn the handle like that. and. I think it's going down, but then it pulls it along, and that's when they get really mad and they just attack it. Yeah. It's, you can't do that technique by hand because it just doesn't work that way. Is that just like, just basically imitating a uh, dying bait fish? I guess it does. Like, you know, yeah, a little dive bait fish. Yeah, you, we've all seen it, right? And fall. Yeah, and then it hits back up. That's right. Nice little yeah. Fish. And, and that's why we get, and I've taught my kids to do the same way, and they catch a lot. I don't know. This thing's worked for me. But anyway, it's, you got to play around and get the technique right. But but the most important part, like you say, mate, is, is to have big contact the whole time. Yeah. Obviously, I'm using, when I use vibes, I don't do that. I, I'm forever just working the vibe yeah. and then in contact with the line the whole time and just doing little short loops. But uh, with um, plastics, I do that technique. Yeah, if you've got heaps of slack line with a vibe, um, they tend to foul up a lot. So I fish. Uh, heaps keep, of keep it tight. Line, sorry. Yeah, yeah, keep it tight all the time. Yeah, um, keep it tight all the time. And follow it down. Yeah. So. So we've got to decide, okay, we've got to even know how to do a technique. So I'm going to look at um, where we're going to fish for the day and the tide size. Tide size is very important to your jig heads and to your, to your bait size. 
And if I'm going to pitch the flats, like I was saying before, in two to six foot of water, we're pitching around weed beds, we're looking for areas that have uh, maybe a big sandy patch the size of half this building and weed around it or weed down either side of it. We're drifting down the sandy part, we're casting to the, to the edge of the weed all the time. Or maybe there might be a sand patch just behind the weed, try and land in that and pull one out of there because that's where they're sitting. They're sitting there in the sand, waiting for the baitfish to come out of the weed and they just nail it, okay? So we're trying to emulate that same scenario. Um, I think what, the biggest thing is as well, don't overlook anything. Like I've caught heaps of flatties out of stingray holes. Um, yeah. But it's because A, after stingrays work the area, it's a lot softer sand in it, so it's easy for them to bury. And um, it's just an ambush point. Like they're under the sand level already, waiting for anything to go past, but they always cast it for anything. Like a little stick, they'll sit next to a stick and wait around the stick, they'll get anything. I think it's good. And, yeah. and, and if you're fishing together as two guys and someone gets a hit and misses it, generally it will come back, but if not, if your mates, or if you're wearing your line in at the same time as you make it a hit, throw your lure right next to where his line is, and quite often you'll get his fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, it's true. Yeah. We have flooded classic all the time. So you, you work on each other, and vice versa, he'll do that to you too. And then there's a punch-up? <laughs> <laughs> Only if he does net shots like Stewie. Oh my gosh. No, I don't want to talk about that. Okay. Yep, so we've got our lines there, lines all rigged up. Make sure your spills are full, okay? If you're going to put line, you bait on, please bring it to us and we'll put it on for you. I'd rather we do it than maybe you guys might not have a bit of doing it, but it is crucial that your casting is perfect every time you cast. It makes life so much easier if you've got a nice flowing out cast where you don't have to try and get it out there, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah and a lot of people that yeah. put it on, they don't put it on tight enough and then you get wind knots and it's a yeah, pain. That's It'll right. turn your afraid forever. Yeah. But yeah, we put on nice and tight. And if you do, if you just start to get wind knots, you just got to get that knot out. Most of the time, just wet it and it will pull out. But try, if it's if it's a really big bunch, you need to try and just pull it through and pull it through and pull it through and try and find it which, one it, which way it goes. And then eventually it'll pull out. Um, then just do a cast, but hopefully not another wind knot. <laughs> and hold your finger and one on really tight and fast back well, onto the reel. Rod. Six casts. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Yeah, no, try not, you're trying to get the good cast to start, so... And tip wraps. Tip wraps are a pain in the backside with light lines. So only problem with light lines, they get tip wrapped quite easy, okay? So, and particularly when you're casting into the wind, it's a pain. And particularly if you do a lot of high lifts, that's even more of a pain. So, if you're trying to eliminate the high lifts and just do short ones, that'll eliminate it straight away. And if you can cast not into the wind or not fish into the wind, that'll help it as well. Okay. Um, so, yeah, going back to the plastics, what we're going to do. So... If I had a selection here and I was going to fish the flats, I'd keep it under that um, sort of 100 mil, around 60 to 85 mil so size plastics, 100 max. Um, and I'd keep my jig head size around about that one sixth to about one quarter with maybe a couple of three eighth heads there just in case I go on the edge of the bank where it's a bit deeper. Um, would you do anything different to that, Stu? Um, yeah, I've got a, like I normally fish on my lightest rod, I'll fish like a two inch plastic, always, very mm. small. Mm. And on my heaviest rod on the flats, I'd fish like a nine inch slugger or a slapstick style. I don't, you didn't bring any up, did you? No, come around here, sorry, that's right. No, did you no, no, bring any slapsticks up, did you? No, I didn't. No. I'll show you when you're downstairs. Don't anyway. talk about it. It's, um, <laughs> that's a really good method for catching big fish up in the shallows on the high tide. Um, you just rig a weedless with a stinger hook. Um, there's a few different tricks. I cut slits in it to make it fold easier. It's so quite a big plastic. But um, yeah, so I have that on my heaviest rod and then I'll just fish two inch on my lightest rod and like three or four inch. I just want to come around here and pick out six packets of plastics you take fish on the day if you're going to fish on the flats. Yeah. We'll do flats and deep, okay? So you've got to understand what we're doing. And then I'll pick my six and see if they... I'll turn this way. <laughs> he can hold up, so just don't tell me about ours, Yeah. Uh, it's a little reflection in the television. Yeah. How many dogs? Five. Six. Six. Sorry. Not including five, right? Just five. So I'll show you. So that one there, 
just a bright curl tail. I can't say that because I can say it. But anyway, um, I'd fish that if the fish in, like if it's sunny day, last couple of hours of the incoming tide, and it's a little bit hard. That's the hardest stage, but fish that and fish it really slow. Um, three inch. I'd fish that on, I'd probably fish it run out tide, like in drains and stuff like that, off of the weed beds. Because um, all the bait coming out of the weeds are generally a lot smaller. Um, I always like a curl tail if fishing's really tough and just work it really slow. Like that's something that I'd run on that three pound setup. I'd run the, that one. That's one of my favourites actually. Um, doesn't really matter about water clarity, I don't mind. Bright, bright and clean water, bright and dirty water, I don't care. Um, but fish it fairly fast and lots of contact with the bottom, probably on about a three eighth of an ounce head. Um, I always like, I'm just gonna say it because there'll be one of Doug's as well. The swimming mullet are one of the most underrated flatty lures ever. Um, really good if the bite's hard and they've been working really good this year. So I never liked, I never liked them at all. Um, I always thought it was a bit of a gimmick and things like that, but I started fishing them the last couple of weeks and you gotta change your action, you gotta jig more of the slack line um, and really get that little tail working, but they work really well. Tail top. Uh, it's like a segmented tail top thing. Yeah, yeah. Dougie? Did you put yours back there? I'll put mine back there. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, uh, I'll definitely I'll get that one. Anyway. That one worked the other day. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd go, I like little two inch prawns. Okay, they're just um, really good. Uh, even in water up to about three metres deep, they're extremely good. That's a gulp. I'm a bit of a gulp fan. I like all gulps actually, but, but some do more for me than others. Um, Without a doubt, my number one would be either Nemesis Shrimp, which is that one there, in any colour, or um, three inch, three inch shrimp. Um, like they're just my go-to. Why do I like three inch shrimps? Um, because um, particularly with the football jig head, they glide. So when you lift up and you fall, they don't just fall; they actually glide. They, they get like like a glider. They go a long way. And when I do that, uh, they glide that way. When I do the spin the handle thing, they shoot back the other way. <laughs> and it pees them off and they attack it pretty hard. Um, color wise, I'm a bit of a malting shrimp fan. I really like malting sugar spice. <coughs> and I write the pink tails and I write the glows. But three inch, so that's my, that's three so far. But that's my color that is, that'll work. Um, sorry, I've got my thing back on there. Probably a pumpkin seed in the swimming mullet. Pretty hard to beat. Very good lure. We've got guys that buy those by the 10 packets because they just that's their flat to go to, that's all they buy. Um, okay, these little um, atomic in the fat grubs. Um, that fellow there with five inch, which is what Stewie's got on one of his lines there. Um, that over the many years has nearly made me win the flat classic probably twice, or nearly when I come second. <laughs> Always runner up. Um, but it's just a really good lure. It works um, on the flats on the edge of Kalinga where you've got that little flat that comes up on the bank down jumping pin way. You have like a mud bank and then they have about a three to six metre shallow area and then it drops off to the deep. In the shallow area when the waves are breaking on there and it's uh, clear water, that thing just absolutely smacks them badly. Um, so that's five packets. Uh, and probably a white one in the gulf or the power bait like that one there in a four inch, that's as big as I'll go in a plastic. Uh, generally speaking, that's, not, that's fish in the shallows, something like that size there, in a four inch power bait. Did anyone ever use this sort of thing? Yeah. This, uh, um, the silver mud or whatever, or the white pearl. Extremely good. Um, so I'll pass those around, that would be my go-to, by six packets. Oh, no, sorry, I forgot one. Important. <laughs> one I've just started using this year and absolutely done really well on it. I, mean, I haven't been with Stuart as well, by the way. This fella here, this is um, the Boom Baits by Samaki. So, do you, has anyone here used Z-Mans? How many people use Z-Man type plastics? 
Okay, they're a pain in the backside to put on your head as you all know, right? You've got to measure it out spot on. And then half the time you get a fish on, they, they, they just, it's, they're so soft, the hook pushes through and sticks out the side, and then you've got to um, try and pull it back out, but it's elasticised. So you've got to try and fight with it to get it to come nice and clean again, to put it back in clean. But they catch fish. And boom baits are made the same material as are um, the new uh, squidgy ones are made the same material too, which is the bio baits. They're also that 10x type material. Um, but what it means is they stretch so far. I think one of these, oh, one of my rods had one the other day, but I must have lost it. Oh, I did, I cast it off, I think. I've oh, got snow back on it. But um, so they do that, okay? They don't break. Oh, they do break. <laughs> they do that. <laughs> this is a new tail saw. It works quite good, actually. <laughs> Anyhow, they stretch very well. I'll try number two. But they catch a lot of fish. That's the problem. They'll, they'll catch like 20 fish before they break, you know? So, yeah, well, still, they still stretch. But you do have any other one that's going to snap off. But they are really good. So I'll pass these six around. You can have a look. And um, they are, that would be my top six. So I've got that. 100% the prawns. Um, I was always a, a pearl white prawn man, um, but then I decided that after about 10 years using white only, it worked so well, I decided to switch to other colours and they all seem to work. But uh, pearl white molting, I think it's probably right up there. Uh, that one. Pearl white, do you mm. prefer fishing it in the shower, uh, clear or a good question, I use them both and it works in both. It definitely works in both. Yeah, gulp has that, that's why I say like using gulp. Gulp has that advantage of. Um, it's like using uh, what do I even grab? X factor. I think. It's uh, like, like using X factor. It's it has that built-in pheromone that they just want to eat it. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if it's clear water, dirty water, whatever. They smell it and they want to eat it. It's a bit cheating, maybe like using bait sort of. What if you use a pearl in a different sort of bulk, or would you rather use that in the dirty water? Or uh, I'd rather use the prawn. A hundred percent, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it glides. I don't know. Maybe they. Feel the harmonics in the water or something, I don't know, because it's moving a lot more than normal jig, it just falls down the bottom. Yeah, but I know right. what you're trying to say with colour as a whole. Um, I've fished, yeah. I've fished it in dirty water, I've fished in clean water. Yeah, that's right, yeah. It doesn't matter if but it's two foot or 50 foot. Yeah, and same with that colour there, that colour works in clean and dirty, so it's a complete opposite. But again, I keep saying like it's like gulp, so that it's the smell as well, I think. Yeah. The non scented plastics you'd seen? 100% with S factor. And yeah. How and would you say that's about every, it lasts not too bad, maybe 10 casts. Yep. Which is about two fish. <laughs> <laughs> we count the fish, not casts. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> um, my other one here, sorry guys, get this together for you guys. That one, that one, that one, oh, the fierce one. Oops. Let's check out this too. And that fella, that would be my go-to, I think. That's the three inch. Sorry, folks, you know you're right here. Is it? Oh, there it is, right there, sorry. One, two, three, four, five, and my six one. Oh, the little two inch gulp. Over here, it's spot on, Stewie. Oh, um, no, I prefer paddle tail. More than curly tail, 100%. The only time I ever use curly tail is in that one there, the gulp, or if I'm fishing the deep in something like those bad boys, or or a smaller size like that. Um, you know, my kids, I used to put that sort of thing on for them when they were younger. Like I say, when they wind it, the tail stretches out and it swims, because yeah. they have, kids have a habit of just winding, right? It works. So if you've got kids, throw on a grub tail. They'll catch more fish than, than, a, than a paddle tail. So, um, and of course, I see them catch fish, I think well, I'm going to have to switch to that, especially they get one more than I've got. <laughs> so, um, I'll keep it in my, I always keep a couple of bags there, two colours. I like, I like very, um, that's luminous, so it's very good in dirty water and good in clear water too, boy. And I really do like sort of motor oil, sort of brownie, sparkle type colours, uh, like pumpkin seed type colours. They seem to work in anything. Um, unfortunately, they don't do white in those. Um, this is how sharp hooks is, true. Um, they don't do white in much in grubs these days, so, except for bigger ones, so therefore it's not as good. Um, you can't 
can't get the white grub, but they do work as well. So that'll be my sixth go-to. I'd survive on those, I reckon, forever. There's always this flat in the water. <laughs> um, was any yours different, that's Joe? No, I just chose that Z-Man shrimp. Oh, you like, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Stewie's just like started that. using these easy shrimps. Yeah. And the other day, I will admit, he caught quite a few fish on it. I was pretty impressed. Um, I've tried using them. I haven't had much luck. We've got a couple of customers, Barnsley, Kane. They like using they these. Them, yeah. And they get a lot of fish on them. Has anyone used the easy shrimps yet in the Z-Man range? Yeah. And how'd you go about it, right? Yeah, the tip I've got a day for a Oh, did you? Yeah, okay. Oh, right, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah right. Serious. <laughs> that's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's going to be like my range, and probably Stewie's very similar range for the flats, okay? Yeah. Um, and if you've got something like that yet in home, then you're, you're a winner. You're going to do well. And those jig heads, we all know that went around before. That's the sort of size jig heads we're using. Um, fishing the deep, Stuart, what would you choose? Fishing, fishing the deep, the deep I'd just fish either a five inch, like jerk shot, straight tail type thing. Um, four or five, I don't yeah, mind. That, that one's okay, that, that does both yeah, shallow that, deep. That That's works four. quite well. Um, and I just fish that on a half ounce bed. If, if the tide's gone that hard that I can't make contact with a half, I won't fish it. Mm. I don't know if the dog's different, but you see guys yeah. fishing the deep the whole tide. I don't know how they do it, do they? That's the heavy. But um, yeah, I just fish it until I can't make bottom with a half and but, then I'll move to the flats and fish a drain or a runoff or something like that. There's a couple of secrets to fish in the deep. How many people have fished the deep, say, the Seaway or Kalinga Bank or, or out towards the mouth of the pin bars? Has anyone done that yet? Yeah. Okay, you've done it right, mate. You've done it right, haven't <laughs> At times. Yeah. At times, yeah. Have, have you grown? You haven't done it? Right? No, no one else? I've never had any luck with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the couple of tricks are the first thing is, like I was saying, for that brown crawdad, on the high tide or on the first the run out, the fish, will, and you've got, fish you've got those little waves, the little swell comes in along clinging back there. Is it a green zone first before going further? Is it a green zone? It's not a green zone. I don't really know. Um, and I suppose there's new rules where the green zone comes even out like 30 yeah, metres or 50 metres from the shoreline. Depends who you yeah. ask. Yeah, depends if national parks are there or fisheries too, by the way. National parks are stinging it. Fisheries will probably warn you. Yeah. Um, so, but I. My argument point would be, um, we don't have GPSs and there's no boys in the water saying, except for those boys over there, I'm not going to go near those. But there's none out there telling me I can't fish out here, so that would be my argument point. But I, I, I was looking at the green zone there yesterday, yeah. and it says low tide. Low tide, yeah. So yeah. the low tide market, where the low tide is, yeah. is where yeah. they were claiming the green zone was. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, if you have a map that comes out like 30 metres off the bank. That's right. That's working yeah. off the low tide one 40 years ago when it first yeah. started. Yeah, that's and right. COVID, yeah. So. Yeah, now it's like the main channel. Yeah. So like even, <laughs> even that, um, that bay there, yep. that's moved down about 80 metres. Yeah, Swan yeah, right. Bay. Yeah. That's moving all the way down there. Yeah. yeah. For those who don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about down the jumping pin. Um, some of those maps there we'll show you a bit later. But um, right at the mouth of the jumping pin bar, um, the North Stratty side, uh, you've got the end of North Stratty and there's a big bay and it's called Swan Bay that's protected. That's the national the green zone. There will be a lot of floaties now, I dare say. At the front of that though, um, there's a buoy, but you can't go past that buoy, it's a green zone. Um, but then, uh, as, as we all said, sometimes some people, some uh, like national parks that use a, the old datum, I think, and the green zone started way out where, the, where the boats are now driving along. It used to be shoreline there one time, so sometimes they might say that's where it starts, but there's no buoys there, and I don't know, so it's a bit of a hard one. The hard I, I got warned there only about three weeks ago chasing did you really? Yeah. And what they say, mate? They say like. Uh, they just said to me, mate, you, you're right on the border of the green zone right now. I was, I was 40 metres from the borderline. Exactly right. That's exactly like right. Boy. Yeah. Yeah. Go oh, easy. Well, yeah. from that, yeah. 60 metres from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So more towards more east of that. Like yes. The yeah, they need. Stuff. They need to put like a row of boys along there to say yeah. no. Yeah. yeah. We were but, out in the drift there the other day. Mm. On that high tide. Yeah. Looked at your screen and you're well inside, like you're yeah. good 30, 40 metres. Yeah, yeah. And it comes right out. Yeah, yeah that's I right. think. Is that the latest but version of Navionic? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've got that. Yeah. yeah. But, but that's the thing, like, not everyone has a GPS no, that's right. no, they don't. in their boat. Especially so. tinnies, yeah. Well, that's right, yeah. And, and the, but the thing is, it is such a great fishing spot. Okay. 
<laughs> it's yeah, most most screen time is generally up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know that's true. Yeah, well, don't speak for me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you heard? Yeah. Um, but anyhow, so um, for those who watch it, they're not fisheries officers, but we're just trying to tell our customers the right thing. <laughs> um, but anyhow, um, it's really important that you understand that before you go there, because the fisheries do come up, you may be implicated. But um, we still go there and, and fish what we believe is not the green zone, and we get a lot of fish there. And uh, getting back to what I was saying before, if you get that high tide and it's cracking on the bank, you try and cast up close to the bank, um, and then just hop your lure with little lists. They're sitting right up on that where the wave breaks. They're right up there. Same as Swan Bay. I mean, uh, Crusoe Island on uh, Tank. Right. We call it Tank Bank. Tank Bank, yeah. Which right is on the board. northern side of Crusoe Island, if you know where Crusoe Island is, which is between Tipless Channel and the Pin Bar. There's one big island there. And on the northern side of it, there's a bit, bit of a bay that's quite shallow at low tide, but high tide is quite, it's probably a metre deep or so, or a bit more up, up in the shallows. And that's where we got a couple of good fish the other day, got a few there actually. And um, at this time of year, the big girls will school up there and the little boys will be there too. And, uh, and it's great fishing, especially get that uh, bit of subtly wind, where it's, it's calm and subtly wind there. And those waves will be just rolling through a break on the edge of that mud bank, and they're sitting right up tight on it. So, you cast in there and just sometimes you first hop, it's just straight away on the big fish. And uh, um, and you just scout right along that edge there. The hard part is you have an electric outboard, it's quite hard to stop yourself from getting pulled into the, to the edge of the shoreline there. How many people have electric outboards? So probably half of you. Okay, um, this is the funny part. In, in the classic, we've always done fairly good. And um, I've always had electric outboard uh, but I rarely use my electric outboard. To turn yourself into a good fisherman, you don't need an electric outboard. You need to know how to work the tide, the current, the wind, and your boat. Okay? If you're an electric outboard, though, you can use it. Um, and I just still use it at times. And we used to use it the other day because it's just yeah. a couple times convenient. But I never had one until not six months ago. Yeah, I was never had one. and I lashed out and bought <laughs> yeah, one. But yeah. um, before that, I think it makes you... 99% better fishermen if you can fish without it. Because if you look at most people with electrics, once their electric packs it in or runs out of battery or whatever, they wouldn't have a clue. Half of them go home. They, um, they don't know how to read water. They don't know how to set up a drift with wind or tide. They're too fixated on pulling up to a spot saying, oh, there's a hole there, I know it. Go over, press spot lock and fish that and that's it. Whereas you've got to use your brain if you don't have the electric and set up a drift run or be a lot smarter about it. But, yeah. So, and some of the tricks are, sometimes you have to use anchor, they have to use an anchor if you're going to fish those holes that Stuart's talking about. Um, this is for the people who don't have electrics, okay? Um, but it's so important to understand how to do it right. And um, I, I use my motor as a, you know those uh, American boats that have the poles rammed down to the ground and they lock themselves in? Uh, I use that for my motor. It's probably the right thing to do, but... <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll work out the tide, I might have, say, there's a place called Shooter's Ditch, which is um, near Tipples Channel, on the, if you all know where Shooter's Ditch is. Actually, it's on this map. If you grab your map out. So we're still talking about the gear we're using on the day, right? Uh, okay. So it's the map on the right-hand side, where it's got 3.2 at the top. And um, I haven't marked it, which is probably a good thing. But yeah, <laughs> I didn't go by hills here, Stuart. <laughs> but where it says 3.2, it becomes straight down and it sort of goes like a bit of a V at the bottom, that little bit of red. Um, there's a little channel between between here and here. There's a little bit of a channel there, you can see that. The main channel's over on the right here where the red dots are, but that left is called Shears Ditch. And that is a very, very, very good flathead spot. Okay. We call it Gulf Mall. Dolphin hole there, yeah? You get a few dolphins in there? We got the white fishing. Oh, okay. Oh, they do. The dolph I've seen dolphins in there do that. Yeah. Yeah, they, they smack them. Yeah, they do. Um, but it's a great spot for flatties. So that green part obviously comes out nearly at low tide. It's, it's pretty well out of the water, right? So that channel, what happens is that big bay in here, uh, which is, most of this is underwater up this end, but this big bay in here, um, I call that Jurassic Park because we've, I've lost some really, really, really big flatties there, like I believe a metre plus. Um, haven't got one in the boat yet. Got a lot of 90s, but not, not a metre. But 
they, this little pass is like cut them off at the pass. So when the tide drops out, they'll either sit in here if it's safe or whatever, or they'll drop into this channel, which is Tipper's channel. And you always see me on my reports, I also say Tipper's channel, that's what I'm talking about. And when the tide starts to come in, they'll all come in and they'll shoot up here and they'll go and feed in, in Jurassic Park. Um, so, but what you do, if you don't have an electric and you're just using your motor, um, because you've got tidal drift and you might have a bit of northerly blowing, you just back yourself in along this edge here, on this green edge here. You can see it's down the back, I'm really hard, sorry guys. I think we're going to bring this up on the screen but later, anyhow, but we're going to talk this later. But um, back your boat on there, turn your motor down onto the seaweed and hold yourself there. And, um, and that see, reverse up as much as you can to the shallows and then just tilt your motor down and hold yourself there with the nose pointing to the current. And you just cast up current and you hop it back. And you can do that for about an hour and a half till the tide gets too high. And I'll just, um, once I feel the boat move, I might just drift back about 20 metres and cast, because I don't like casting down current, I always cast up current, okay? And then I'll set the motor in again and I'll work the last 20 metres from where my boat was before back to my boat. And I keep working and working and working until I can't reach the bottom of my motor anymore. So I can't lock myself down. That's when he's the anchor, but that's painful. Um, and that's how you sort of do th little things like that. That's all you need to know. So, so when you say up current, you mean yeah. current, current come down towards you, so I cast yeah. it up into the current okay. and hop it back. So you, for those of you who know, and if, if, even if you're land based, it doesn't matter. If you don't, if you cast down current into the uh, with the current, and then he's like GK, you, you rarely make contact with the bottom, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Even if you've got really thin braid, it still doesn't get to the bottom. And so you just flog the deadles. You need to bounce it down the current. They're sitting in the current and they watch it coming towards them and they're going to nail it straight away. That's how it sort of works. How, how deep does that end? <laughs> so, so shut they keep talking on me. Sorry, mate. How deep does that end? And you end grounds about uh, it's, three foot down Yeah, about three You get like a six meter boat in there, right? At low tide. Yeah. There's actually a stable oh, long corner now. Yeah. I think it's probably crap to put it in. But the width of it's probably about 20 metres or 15 metres wide at low tide. Yeah. The, the entrance is pretty narrow. But it only it holds... Opens up. The entrance is tiny. Yeah, yeah. It's tiny. It's yeah, the tiny, that's right. Yeah, the tiny... That's right. It looks big, but it's only tiny in. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Tiny, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. No, that's right, yeah. Very good, yeah. So I always say to guys offshore fishing, get put the Navionics app on your phone. It's very accurate. It's down like within two feet. And if you just follow the channel in on, on your Navionics, you'll see yourself put a little push start, a little yellow track goes along, you see yourself going along. And you just follow it in the channel in exactly like you're saying, mate. And you're in there. Yeah, it's easy. Well, before I had GPS, I literally used... Um, Navionics app? No, no. Oh, no, Google Earth. Maps. Yeah, Google Maps. For, it, it's very accurate too, by the way. Just zoom right in. You yeah, that's right. That yeah, that's it. Exactly right. Yeah, no, spot on. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sure really fast to trim it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyhow, so um, we're going to do that, but for the deeper water, if we decide, okay, we're going to get a deep water fishing for the day, um, then different scenarios, same rods and reels, um, just up, up our leader strength a bit more. Um, and you still do catch a lot of little fish in the deep, but you get a lot more bigger fish in consistency if they're stacked up. It's a better average. Better average. And stacked up means uh, it can be on a moon. There might be, the girls might be getting ready on the moon, where it might be. Um, or it could be also to do with um, um, just bait that's there at the time or, or things. There's many things come to consideration, but um, your plastic size, like Stuart said before, you're going to start at about that four inch uh, one that went around before and up to bigger things. So. Um, I like to use like these sort of, these are gulp again, <laughs> um, but they're a chicken, five inch chicken grub, so it's just a bigger version of the other chicken things with the curl tails. But those tails are very skinny, so they're really straighten out like, like these little arm. Um, I'm going to move these soft, put these chickens in. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'll, I'll put them over here. <laughs> like that's something that I would use in the day, it's that four inch, just a minnow. I'll pass around for you, Stuart. Eh? Just on a um, just on the half ounce head. Uh, I just like using that straight tail minnow because it'll sink faster. If you've got a big curl tail, it's just resistance in the water and it's just drag. It's going to take longer. You need heavier weight to get it down. Yeah. Yeah. These are good too in the in the uh, deep as well. So I'll pass those around. It's probably sort of plus that quarter one up and around, and that's 
white one. That's probably sort of five or six that you'd, you'd use. Um, but guys with the bigger tail coming around, there's a, uh, I think it's a six inch gulp tail there in the grub. It's very popular. It's also popular for guys fishing at Jewies. But you up the ante on the jig here, so you're fishing around 40, 50 foot of water. And when the tide's ripping on those full moon tides, um, and you a little bit of easterly blowing or northeast blowing, you need to up the ante even on, on six or 10 pound braid. So I'm using like three quarter, five o, or an ounce six o, or something like that in the jig head. The hooks these days are extremely sharp. So people say, oh, we're using 10 pound braid and how can you set a six o hook? Well, you can, because they're sharp. And the braid, you know, it's strong, it's, it's strong, so. And six pound doesn't break at six pound. No, nah. like not, not the straight well pull any questions on that at all guys? I think the big thing is, as well, when you are fishing that deeper water, you need to stay vertical. You need to stay straight up and down. If you've got it out the back or way out the front's not too bad because you can fish it back to you. But if you've got heaps of loose line and it's just like you're trolling it behind you, nine times out of ten, that's just the belly in your line. You feel little taps and stuff and you get thousands of snags and it's just horrible. It's not a good experience. But um, yeah, up and down ways is a secret. And hook up rate, it can be a little bit hard because you pull in the jig head straight upwards. But um, it's not too bad, generally they inhale it, so. I'll pass those around too. Sorry, Paul. Do you see so. the um, slap sticks on the, on the shallow flats? Yep. What do you do? You don't have any of those here, obviously. I don't have any. I'll show you downstairs, yes, Brandon, yes, but yeah. Yes. But um, I always rig the slapstick stuff. That's the only time I use a weed whistle for a flatty. Yeah. Everything else has always got a jig head in it. You see some guys fishing the deep because it's so snaggy with weedless. Weedless hooks like those and stuff like that. But um, I, I don't know. I think more hooks are better. If one snips it, I want to hook it. So, yeah. so you don't do weightless. You don't... Have weights on your, your Still need a bit of weight to um, keep yeah, the head down a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. On the slap stick stuff, no. But um, on any of that stuff, you would, yeah. yeah. How do you guys find your hookup rate on a weedless compared to a jig head? Uh, I'd probably say... Not as, no as good. Yeah, nowhere near. Probably one in ten. Even if you've got it sticking. Yeah, if you stick uh, it out, you might be able to get half. Yeah, but you still lose a lot. Stuart does a lot of slapsticks. I don't like it because of that main reason. I just don't want to waste my time losing fish. Anyway. Yeah, and, and yeah, on a stinger. Right. So even using a really good hook on a stinger, the hookup rate's still terrible, you know, yeah. in comparison to using a jig head. But you can't physically use a lure that big with just a little jig head on the front of it. If you're using like your, say, three-inch plastic, you've got a weedless set up on it, mm. and it's kind of like a weed, weed, weed yeah. area, but you yeah. put your weedless on anyway, like that. You push that hook out. So. Do you find your hookup rates a lot less than if you've just got a jig head? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I'm not the biggest fan of weedless heads full stop. I would rather cast like all day and take weed off knowing that I've got a hook ready. Mm. Whereas, um, like even all the like weedless shrimps and stuff like that, like the Zeric live shrimps or the Akuda ones that we do, I'd take the weedless head out and put a jig head in. Yeah, I was fine, and I, I thought I was just me because when I have one of those 3D savage prawns or whatever, yeah. I find that my hook up rate is I've lost some really big fish watching mm. them holding the lure in its mouth, and I'm with setting hooks. Yeah. And the next minute, it just comes straight out. Mm. Yeah. Or you find them all the way to the boat, and yeah. they just look at you and just go, and they, yeah. just they give you a wink and all. And just yeah. Take it. <laughs> yeah, they love it. Yeah. But yeah, I just take it. And like in those shrimp stuff, I just downsize the weight, so I run like a 1.6 or a 1.8. So you still get that cool light, yeah. but you just got that hook hanging out. Yeah. I wonder if it was just me. No, it's definitely no. not. So I was just going to tell you guys with those bigger ones going around, with the guys in the deep water fishing, a lot of guys like Nick White and those guys, they're really good at doing it. And a lot of time they don't actually make contact with the bottom. They'll hit the bottom and they, they cast like the depth, the distance of the depth. So they'll cast 20 foot in 20 foot. Hit the bottom or just drop it down the bottom either way. Hit the bottom, wind up just a little bit and they jerk from that high off the bottom to that high off the bottom. So that's their, the bottom's down there obviously. So they're, they're working that area and the flatties will come up and grab it. So and same sort of technique like diving for threadies and stuff? Yeah. Very similar, that's right. But you're not actually on the bottom at all. Yeah, like and just in that stripe zone where you're yep. looking. Yeah, and yeah well, the flathead always has its eyes up. Yeah. And the other, so if it's dragging on the bottom. The other day we were talking about this and, and we're doing it next to me holding up fish. <laughs> yeah. It works, you know, so it works well. I've got a flatty on the surface of me there the other day. 
Did you? Yeah, well, okay. it brought back up. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, they folded up and grabbed it. All the way to the top. Yeah, yeah. Way yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But well, me and Ezra is a good spot to fish as well. Definitely no green zone there, so that's a safe area to fish. But I don't know where that is. That's the six knot zone between the bedroom and the pin bar. There's that six knot zone there. Well, the big boat's more up. You just got to be, thanks a lot, my friend, again. <laughs> thanks, Tony. You've got to be around about um, uh, probably, you, do, you dr do drift lines again, but you start about probably only um, 10 or 15 metres off the bank, out to about maybe 30 metres off the bank, depends if the boats are in your way or not. And, uh, and you start your drift, it depends if it's running out. Last, I like the last to run out first to run in there, that's my tie for that area. How deep is it, do you know? uh, It's about six metres on average, yeah. Six metres on average. Um, and uh, we did a drift through the other day, we've got a couple of little flatties there, but um, when they're on there, they're on. Like I remember this time last year, just before the Flatty Classic, we were going there um, and getting, I don't know, 20, 20 over 50 maybe in a, in a one hour or two hour session Just before work. Three eighths. Three eighths and halves, that's right. And I used them, I was using big gulp shrimp, the five inch, the four inch gulp shrimp. Four inch shrimp, yeah. And, uh, and just to hop them on the bottom, or cast them a little bit and just hop them back a little bit. But you don't do one hop and you're on straight away. So when they're stacked up there, they're stacked up there. Um, but there's a lot of timber there and you get lose a lot of gear. Great for us, bad for you guys, bad for us when we're fishing. Uh, but this year, we drifted through it on Tuesday, yeah, we, we never snag. got one snag between the two of us, so it's obviously cleaned up a bit. Maybe someone's got to peel up and... Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm like, surely it's throw some trees in here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, whereabouts was that again? That was just through... Uh, so, um, I don't know if it's on that map or not. I'm hoping it, maybe it's not. That's <laughs> so good. Um, the yeah, so on the top of that 3.2 map, where that red line is on the right-hand side, it says Pandanus Island. More or less, just after that bit of red's the start of it on the southern end, and it goes all the way through to where you look and see the big white sand hills. As soon as the sand hills come out from behind the trees, that's about where you turn around and go back up again for another drift. Does that make sense? And you're right up close to the shoreline. Yeah, trees fall in the water, that's right. Um, and trees on the bottom. But there was none the other day, we didn't get snagged up. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a great spot over the next sort of uh, two months. And you can vertical jig there, okay? And it's out of the wind there. It's, it's always blowing east of some tide, so it's a really good spot out of the wind there. So the tide's the crucial part there because it runs too hard. That's correct, yeah. exactly right. So that's why I like the last day of the run out, first day of the run in, yeah. So if you fish the last day of the run out, you're missing all your good. 100%. So, uh, uh, trains, I just, yeah, this is another thing too, you need to learn about what's the best tide to go flat out fishing on. So, it, we go whenever we can go because you've got to learn, when you fish the Flatty Classic, it's constantly changing around and, um, and normally it's on crap tides, so you have to learn to fish crap tides. Um, no offence there, guys, <laughs> but it is. <laughs> it's, it's like a little tide or whatever it might be. Yeah. But the, the best tide to go flat out fishing on is if you've got sort of high tide about 7 in the morning. You fish the top of the tide up along Kalinga or Millionaires or up in the flats casting hard bodies. Um, the tide starts to drop. You will nearly catch flathead the whole run out. You have spots the whole run out. Okay? The last day of the run out, the first, the bottom of the first day of the run in is unbelievable, especially like say first day of the run in, in um, Chitter's Ditch there or, um, or in the deep or um, many, many, many spots are, are fantastic. Uh, like that lagoon, which yeah. is not on there, I don't think. Eastern Edge Cruise. Yeah, Eastern Edge Cruise, so exactly right. That's yeah. right. Um, around Pandanus Isle, the lagoons around Pandanus, so if you can get into them, and that water starts to come out those little creeks and drops into those lagoons, the fish just drop in there, um, getting ready to go over the whole bank. Um, but um, it's really good. But after about two hours of the run in, it's extremely hard for the next three hours to catch fish. Has anyone done luck here? Really good luck on the mid running tide on floaties? You have? Yeah, that's a lot in the um, Albert and Logan. Oh, okay, up the river, okay, it's different. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, mate, yeah, it's rising up on the flats, yeah. 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 Like there's no flats stretching. For a, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Once yeah. the tide starts sort of ankle deep, yeah. and I'm only in a little flat bottom punt. Yep. So I can get where kayakers go. Yep, yep. Get in there. Yeah. Just like, basically just lined up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a mud flats. 
Yeah, yeah. So if you don't mind me saying, I'm going to put in a dog in his body, but, <laughs> but we did really well on that stage of the time with the only spots, and Stuart does really well up around the top of Russell. Um, it's a really good area, that sort of stage of tide, and I like to fish over uh, Cabby Street Point to Rocky Point on that flat there when it fills up. It's a really good area. So you've got to get the western blocks. You're better off not fishing out the front so much in that t period of the tide and get the western blocks and, uh, and fish. Actually, I took Paul up a creek there, and we've done quite well in that tide. Yeah. Just trolling, trolling, trolling yeah. but that's not tro trolling tonight. But... <laughs> But um, at that stage of the tide, you've got to work out what I'm going to do for two or three hours as we fish in a comp say, because otherwise you're just wasting your flogging dead horse. But in saying that, the other day, that tide we went flats and my, our mates killed it in the deep. They, not all big fish, but they got lots of fish. With that classic, mm. it ends at bottom of Russell, just, just a little bit up from Russell. The power lines are yeah, actually right up on the northern end. Yes, yeah, so you know how the power lines sort of go like nearly north across oh, Russell. Right. <laughs> so they go a long way up on the east side. So right up near Lake is there, right, not, not that far, but it's so right when up. when they say power lines, do they mean actually... The power lines. Line, or do they mean from where it starts straight across? Ah, uh, <laughs> no, they mean from one power line to the other, and anything to the side of it is okay, okay yeah. but not that side of it. Yeah, it's actually staggered. So on the western side, like the actual power lines where you get prawns and all that stuff, that's yeah, quite point. low on Russell, yeah. and the other side's way up. It's up near. Um, I didn't know if they meant just yeah, straight, yeah, no, straight no, across, no. So east side can go right up to near um near Lamb Island or, or oh, Pitcher yeah. Mudlow, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, any questions on the deep at all, folks? No. Okay. Do you find you have more success along the flat or the deep? Like mm -hmm. the numbers game. Yeah. I think it depends on the time of year. Mm. Um, if you've got, like around this time of year with a full moon, I'd say the deep's probably the way to go. Yeah. They all move I, to the deep and spawn and things like that. They always feed up hard before or after. I'll, I'll give them some insight. Yeah. On, I'll give you some insight on the worst case scenario and the best case scenario in each one of these spots, okay? So if you grab your map out, and Stu can, you can know the map, Stu, but do you want to put no, it up on the wall here, mate? Put it up on the yeah. We'll put it up on the screen as well, and I'll, and I'll talk to you about each spot because Ms. Arco, my wife said to me, she goes, they're your good spots you give me out there. And I said, actually, they are. And then Stewie saw the map today for the first time. He goes, I wasn't happy. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but you guys are going to learn to catch fish, and, and the fish just come back again next year. Thanks a lot. You're a good man. Um, so um, we'll talk about these spots and how to fish them and the tides. Start up in a minute. So, um, for those folks back home, I'll give you a quick look. It's quick enough. <laughs> 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 but it will be up on the screen here. Should I turn the light off, do you reckon, Stu? Uh, you can't see if things by turning the lights off. Right. No, you want me to see? Okay, so um, we'll start. This is jumping in, this is down the broad water. So, um, and then for those of you that are land based, how many people here don't have a boat? Jumping down the back. So, mate, I'll give you a heap of marks right at the end. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Do you mind? But if you get a boat, tell your mate to go to these spots, okay? Apart from that, anybody wants a, a fishing mate? Yeah. There you go. Actually, a lot, a lot of, over the lot of seminars, a lot of our guys have met guys and done that exact thing, mate. Um, but anyhow, we're up the jumping pin here. So, um, this area here is um, what we call, that's the entrance into, the northern entrance into the bedroom, which you can't get in at low tide, of course. But... On the last the run out tide, uh, and the first the run in, the flathead is stacked up in this corner here where the little creek comes out. You all know where that is against the edge of Stratty. Last, last the run out. Last the run out, first the run in. Which is a good spot everywhere, by the way. <laughs> it's a good time yeah. everywhere, it's as you know. Exactly the whiting stack. Yeah, yeah the whiting stack there too. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then as soon as that tide starts to come in, they'll start to go up into, the, into here, right? Um, but they're sitting there, and, and the water there is about six to eight foot deep. There's quite a few leaf, uh, weed clumps that go all the way down along this edge, all the way down the Pandan Island, a lot down this area. And you just drift that whole area and you cast in the edge of the weed. Cast the edge of the weed is so important everywhere you go. You've got to be, have a bit of sand, because weeds are pain in the backside, but you need to have sand, and they're 
I'll, I'll come out of the weed and grab it. Is that, is that Rose? Rose, just up here, mate. Right? Yeah, a bit further up. Yeah, you know where the, that goes around, they call it um, land mine corner or something, because everyone camps there and digs their poo in there. That's one of that. Um, now, um, if you can get into here at low top, it's quite hard. I didn't mark it here, but this is a lagoon here. It's quite good fishing in here. Um, and especially, again, the first running tide, those fish come in there and they sit in there and they wait for the water to disperse over this bank that's normally out at low tide. And when the water starts to spread out, they all spread out. But you'll, you cut them off at the pass there. They're in there just waiting and they're, they're hungry because they're getting ready to feed. So if you can get them there when they're in there, and, and Adam's done really well there at times. Um, same with the cereals through here, it's all good. So they're, uh, just, so they're essentially stuck. Is they no, they can get in and out, but they 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 stack up ready to feed. So stack up ready to go over the bank. Yeah, and they're ready in. I think their their heads in feed mode already. So you you've got a good chance. Um, this is down along um, heading up to the bedroom. So down along Strady Edge here, and that's right down to Ducks is where the TSS school camping is there. Um, all that. Lagoon in there, it's like a lagoon at the oyster lease on the outside edge of it, sort of thing. All that inside there is really good too. There's a jetty there, you'll see the jetty, go about as far as the jetty, okay? Just drifting through there, casting, um, it's only about six to eight foot deep, uh, and casting any of that really light stuff is really good. Um, this over here now, um, this is Gold Bank. So if you know where Gold Bank is, it's sort of like um, opposite. It's the opposite there. The tiger mullet there. Tiger mullets are up there, that's right, and that's Wally's through there. Is that Wally's? Oh, no, that's not Wally's. No, that's, that's Wally's, no, sorry, that's, that's Wally's. Wally's. Yeah. yeah, Gold tiger Bank's here. Yeah, yeah where, the th where the three is where Gold yeah. Bank is, that's Wally's there. Um, so that whole edge there, all the way along, is good, even down to about, although near the red here actually, but all the way along there, it's quite good. Um, it's a great spot there. When that bank becomes exposed, the fish move off and they're still on this edge here, you can cast it, uh, pepper it pretty hard. And exactly the same on the side here, there's a little drain runs out here, and the fish, once that bank comes out, they fall out of that drain, they sit all the way along this edge here. And, uh, and you cast that, and it's a really good spot on the first to run in there as well. And, and you can drift out in the middle of the channel, I'll sit lined up at the middle of the channel. We've had like 30 or 40 flabby sessions there with my kids. Even like last year, you know? haven't done much this year yet in that area. Um, Not good on the weekend. No, the weekend a lot of boats get through, but I've, I've been there, we've just all been hooked up, three of us hooked up with 40 foot Rivieras going past us, you know. Yeah, so when they're on, they're on in that area. Wipes the door, yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> See legs down. Um, then, obviously, Shitter's Ditch we talked about earlier. This corner here is fantastic, it's one of my favourite spots. Um, coming down the tipless channel here, and um, there's a yellow here and a black there, and the channel comes down here. Oh, it's, it's actually, it's, is it green? That's a yellow, I think. Oh, it might be green. Yeah, green boy. Yeah. And yeah, that edge of that bank, there's two or three greens along here, and all the way along that edge is uh, fantastic as well, particularly up here at the end uh, where it starts. There's a bit of a ripple there, and there's a lot of clumps of weed out the middle of the channel that all the boats go over the top of. It's about 12 foot deep, but the clumps of weed there on the sounder. And if you've got Polaroid glasses, which you should definitely wear when you're flatter fishing, because you'll see the fish come up. Um, that and probably a little like the man said before. So um, if you see that happening, it's a bit like squid fishing, just quickly drop your bail and let it fall back down. I'll just hit it on the way back down, or you make cast next year. Um, but uh, on that edge, it's really good. And then down in here, um, there's a lot of good weed patches down in here. Another dog took Stewie there, showed him. And I said Stewie be fish there, and we got half a dozen in yeah. half a dozen it's, casts in. It's <laughs> something like a day. Yeah. It, it was hard fishing, but they seemed to be there. And mm. That was quite is good. It, is that what you call the Jurassic? Yeah. So I've got a lot of 90s and 80s in here, and I lost the fish there a few years ago. I was over to me, and it's the biggest one I've ever had for it. But I was trolling though, but ripped my hooks off my door. Yeah, but I've got to see it. Weed's really bad, then that's the secret of fishing. They hang in the weed, and particularly when you're trolling, the man that takes the most weed hooks wins the comp. <laughs> there is two is sand channels in there. There is two sand I, That's why I never fish no, on. I know yeah. it's a thin area, like literally on the back yeah. of the 
Yeah. Is it, it's not a it's, hole, we call it the, right, we yeah. call it the runway. The runway. Yeah. There's a there's a stretch there about. Every time I fish in that, just shit gets wet. Yeah, no. Yeah. You got to you got to go there when the tide's right, and you can see where the runway is and mark it on your plotter, and then you just drift it and cast it, and you won't get any weed. And it's about probably it's wider than this area here. This shop here. It's probably ten or twelve meters wide and about 300, 400 metres long and there's actually three of them. There's weed in between and you just drift down them. And lots of fish. And the weird part is you look on maps and you can't see it. No, see it. Yeah. And it's it just beautiful like sand, solid beautiful weed. sand. But it is with plain. Weed either side. Yeah. I used to help make your crab run on the Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's always crab boys around here. Yeah. Um, this edge here when the tide comes open, Mark, I'm going to put Uh, you can as long as your boat's sort of sub five and a half metres. You've got to go through shitters and up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can't get past that. You can't on your property. Yeah. <laughs> you can't go this way, okay? If you've got Doesn't paint work. on the, your prop and your skeg, you're not a flat air fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should be shiny silver. That's right, yeah. polished. Um, so, but up further here where we get a lot of the uh, big flatties up in this area here, um, it's got to be a high tide only. You can't get in there. Even a little boat won't get in there. A flat punt line. Um, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> that is how we done. So this is um, not a bad edge here. This is where everyone comes unstuck on the big boats and then ends up on the sand. And it's that really tight red green area. But when the tide comes in up here, it runs over this bank. And I don't know if you all know, but this is this, the meeting place for the jumping pin tide and the seaway tide. So the seaway tide pulls all the way from here back to the seaway, and jumping pin only pulls from here. Does it's not, I would have thought the jumping pin would start eating all this, but it doesn't, it's not that strong. The seaway is. So the seaway pulls from here back and pushes up to here on the run in. And that junction is where a lot of things happen, a lot of fishing there, a lot of boats hit sandbags. <laughs> but uh, when it's low tide, that's all exposed. And I was just saying to the other day, I said, geez, a low, low. Well, at normally low tide, there's still water in there, right? It was seagrass. So it's obviously filled up and the seagrass has grown really quick from last year. Do you, like, do you like that bale of that directly across from that? Yeah, I do. There's some good pumps over here too. Yeah, yeah. good spot. Not many, yeah, not many people fish there though. Well, maybe after tonight though. We'll <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some bloody plastic weekends, so I don't fish it, but... Yeah. We're going to look at a local pump, maybe I'll come from it. Yeah, in the classic there is, yeah, that's right particularly on that edge just there. But um, that's a really good area. And that's called the Measured Mile. There's a couple of little creeks coming out there. That's a good area there to cast as well, all the way along that edge there. Particularly got a bit of Westley blow and it's like a glass out, it's really nice. So as I say, you gotta know where to fish on the, um, the wing, you know? So that's a Westley spot, that's an Eastley spot. Um, that's a, a southerly spot. You know, that's a, a, a northerly spot out the wind from here. And along here, southerly spot, so the winds have flown like a howling 30 knots southerly. You can fish the whole, the whole day in this area here. Um, up on here, you're pretty protected regardless. Um, howling southerly, you, you, you wouldn't really fish there. But, but uh, as I said, east or west, it's not too bad a spot. And you just got to keep understanding where you can fish at the stage of the tide with the wind. Down here at Tipless Channel, that's right where Tipless is there. Um, this whole ledge, this whole bank here along these reds here is really good fishing. And high tide, get up in these flats here and cast is really good. And even in here as well, but a lot of the Wilson boys fish up in here, do really well. Um, and these little creek entrances that dry out low tide, but same deal again, they're a great spot on the first to run in because they're gonna, they're stacked up there, they're waiting to go up on that shallow, once it gets a bit of water over it and they feed. So they're sitting here waiting, they're not sitting on the sea, sea grass because they'll be dry out of the sun. So they're sitting down in here waiting. And just think where that will be and what they're ready yet, to go. Right? Sorry, mate? Couldn't get a fish there yet. You couldn't? No, okay. But the other day, when we were the other day, I was like a fairly late bite. It was like about probably 11 to about 2 was the yeah. best bite period. Yeah. I don't know what time you were there. Yeah, straight downstairs and under that corner, my friend. Yeah, what time were you there the other day, mate? Oh, yeah, yesterday. Yeah, they should have been on the yeah. bite then. Yeah. That would have been halfway up tide, right? Yeah. yeah. You might have been a little bit, like before on the low would have been better maybe. 
the first to run in. Once it's once it gets in over the uh, gap, see? yeah, okay. Once it gets in over the grass, it pretty got low. that. Well, it's pretty low. It's pretty, pretty low. Yeah, it's okay. Exposed, okay, as long as it's exposed, they should be they should be stacked up there. Okay. It's How do you get a <laughs> <laughs> it's, believe it or not, it's not too bad this year. <laughs> no, seriously. No, it's, yeah, it's not bad, it, yeah. It's bad when you throw your, your jig out, you get a lot of that, and it's like... <sighs> and your wine is just like, cuz it, it hang off your thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Painful, mate. This time last year, my folks just down the road. And it was terrible. Oh, it was bad last year. That's right. I gave the layout for 10 minutes, I'm like, Yeah, and yeah, it's really hard to catch fish in that situation. but. And, but when you fish in the comp, the guys that keep taking the most weed off get the most fish and they're back out there again. Yeah. Do you find that strong weed gets caught up in the fish's gills? I don't think they, they, they like, like it at all. Much. They don't like it at all, mate. Mm -hmm. And when you get those days where there's a bit of big current and there's a lot of crap in the water, you can see that crap in the water, I think they don't like those days either, you know? Just yeah. Just yeah, that's right. Oh, I hate yeah. that, mate. That's it's right. Really that's the days. Right. You don't catch much in those days. It's the same as Fraser. When I go tail fishing or Fraser, Oh, the, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, 100%, mate. Yeah, they don't like it. You know what else doesn't like it? Oh, is that right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> you've obviously been done. Oh, I'm going to raise up a quick one, maybe. Me too. Okay, so that's the pin area at this side of the pin that's where it's. I suppose you haven't been to jump in yet. Everyone thinks, oh, it's so far away, but it's not that far away. So for a paralyzed point to jump in, if you're just cruising on 18, 20 knots, which is like 30 k's down, which is not that fast in Tinny, um, you'd be there, you'd be up here in about not even 20 minutes from the paralyzed point. It's quick. And if you've got a faster boat, it's like 10 minutes. It's fast. Um, okay, so between, um, so Kurang Cove, which is just here, and um, up here, you've got the older shots. I didn't put a map there, but it's quite good fishing around the older shots. But you need to know because it's quite a big area with no signage except for the beacons that go right around it. So I don't want you guys to go and go in there and <laughs> do your motors. There's a lot of places to be stuck and yeah, yeah, and, and get stuck yeah. until the tide comes back in again. Google so, Maps um, is a good one to look at that part. Sorry, right? there's a good map on Google Maps. It's pretty detailed. Yeah. you can see all your little channels and stuff. And yeah. Stuff. So have a look around, it's called the older shots, it's a good area to fish, it's a quite a good area. A lot of snot weed though, okay? But it's fishy. Nice okay, so I'm gonna start up here on the broad water end now. So um, this is Brown's Inlet here, this is Brown's Inlet, that's the island. And a few unusual characters live in there, in their boats. Um, yeah. Lots of brown trout. I'll just turn this off for a sec. But uh, <laughs> brown trout. <so. laughs> I remember one time there was a lady there, I don't know what the deal is, but anyhow, in the Flathead Classic, and um, there was a lady there with two guys on the boat, and she used to come out when the boats, the Flathead Classic boat, boats were in there. They normally get like one or two boats in a weekend, but this particular day there's like 10 boats in there. And she'd t come out and have a shower in the morning with no top on and just a pair of panties. And I reckon by about 30 minutes, I don't know how many people rang how many people, but there would be 60 boats in there. <laughs> and they're just doing laps around the, around the sea. I was telling you the other day, and for those of you who are watching, you understand what I'm talking about, if you would have been there. Um, I personally wasn't there, but, but I heard about it. <laughs> Until the phone rang. <laughs> but um, along this whole ledge here, guys, is really good fishing. Um, and uh, it's a bit of a run-out spot and a run-in spot but it's a particular really good run-in spot on the first to run in, same deal again. They're all sitting along this edge here and waiting for that tide to break over that bank and fall into that, that area there. And um, then they'll, they'll lift up onto the bank. So you just drip that whole edge, and we've had sessions there again, 20, 30 fish, Where easy. Where's that direction that over there? Uh, there's an oyster lease just here at the back of that little island. With the pipes. Yeah, pipes yeah. that up, that's right. And uh, but yeah, it drops off really quickly. It goes from like one foot at low tide to eight or ten feet within about three meters of the of the shoreline. Of the weed bed. Fish that edge. Fish that edge, yeah. So do you say that is running? Running tide, Gavin, yeah, that's right. Um, 
I've caught some really big flatties here that have run outside. So I'm going to run out on this corner here, and there's a bit of a bank on that corner next to it, but the little channel goes in the beacon <coughs> there. On the run out, the water drops over the edge into a little bit deep there. You get a bit of a back eddy, and if you can cast onto the, still on the sandy edge, or the, that, something that's deep, and drop it into that hole, and as soon as you first twitch, you, you're going to get a, a good fish. And they just sit there all the time. They're always there on, the, on that run out tide. Uh, sort of a couple of hours after high. Um, and I'll work all the way down to here, all the way along here on this edge, all the way down to this back edge here of the other entrance to, um, to Brown's Bay where the tide uh, drains out of there too. And that becomes nearly dry right across just about. But um, they'll come out, but last the run out tide there is really good. They'll sit in that, um, in that little area. There's clumps of weed there and he's cast around the clumps of weed. And, and really good spot, again, on the run in, they're sitting there waiting, they go back up again, they'll sit all the way along this edge here, actually. They go up on this, on this flat here, and they'll feel on that edge there as well, in about sort of 12 foot of water up there, up that way, it gets a bit deeper up there, and, or 10 foot of water. So, and it can be even 30 metres off the shoreline, they'll be stacked up on that, along there. Uh, we don't get many big ones on there, maybe 75 is about the biggest, but we get a lot of, 40s to 55s, uh, a lot of numbers. Caught lots of 20 and 30 sessions there too. Um, don't get much in this area here, but where the houses are, but um, just past the last lot of boys there, which is just past the jetty, there's a jetty there where the houses are at Karaji on South Karaji. Um, from that, um, where the boys are near the jetty, all the way down to, there's a little creek comes out here, it's about halfway down to South Courage Campground, uh, from the jetty to there, halfway along sort of. All the way along that edge there um, is really good fishing, um, run in and run out. It's one of those places that holds fish all tides nearly. Okay, and a really good spot to fish when you get a bit of hard southeast of Bunga, hard northeaster. It's, it's pretty classy there. Um, once you get out about 100 foot off the shoreline, it's the northern get you, it's crap. But um, if it's any east in it, it's really nice along this edge here. And along, along here too, guys. So it's an area of fish when it's uh, really east in the wind. Um, Stewie, I'll let you talk about this area because that's your area down there. Yeah, I really like Crab Island. I think yeah. Crab Island has a lot of potential, which that's, is like this type of area. That's Big Crab and Little Crab, Runo Bay Marina is just here. Yeah. And um, the Courage Campgrounds over here. Yeah, there's, there's fish there all stages of the tide. Everything's really close. It's easily accessible. You can fish it in a decent sized boat. Um, obviously on the top of the tide, I fish really close to the island. And I kind of fish, there's a bay on the southern, northern end, sorry, around here. Kind of goes in behind, there's a little mangrove top out the front of it. Um, there's a lot of good fish in there, like you can throw your glide baits or big plastics or any of that type of thing. Um, Good spot there for the yeah. slapsticks. Yeah, slapsticks. Yeah. Um, and the eastern side of the island's like exceptionally better than the west. I don't know what is it, what it is. The west of the island's just got a yabby flat to the island and um, it's a bit dead. We, we used to get fish in this little tiny channel here that comes up the inside here. Yeah, a little gutter, uh, the little gutter yeah. there, but it's got a little bit shallow and closed up and the clumps aren't as good as they used to be. And, yeah, it's very weird. And I tried fishing it. Or we could... right you got a couple there? Yeah. Okay, what tide, roughly speaking? Uh, last of the run out. Last of the run out, yeah, okay, yeah. so they're sitting it's in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I was, we I've been doing a lot of squid fishing over on this side here. Uh, this side here, so. And um, I thought, I've got to go cast, it looks so good. But uh, it's been, always been a high tide, so it hasn't been very efficient, very well on high tide. but. It looks so beautiful on the high tide though. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah, well, there's some big ones around at the moment. Yeah. Blackfish. Um, Ephraim, you fished like this too? too? I fished a bit around Ephraim. Um, I really like... It would be more of... Like, I fished around the mangrove line a fair bit. Um, there's some good fish up there. It's not a numbers spot by any means, but it's a quality fish spot. Um, and on the western side of Ephraim, actually, fish is better than the eastern side, I reckon. Yeah, other way around. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a good, there's tufts of weed there. There's always, the bottom's very undulated. 
and um, there's a few rocks and stuff like that, and I think there's a lot that holds the fish there. Yep. There's always bait. There's always reasonably good water. I fished here with my sister Helen last Friday, and we pulled about five fish out of there in the clumps. It was a run, uh, run in tide, and um, I lost a, a big fish there. It's one of those dunks, and yeah. so then the big first head shake it. It just um, broke my 10 pound leader. So it was a really good fish. Um, and I pulled, I think Mark Drew got one here one time. It's uh, 95 or something, 96. Yeah, big fish. I've got some 80s there, but not 90s. Yeah. But, um, and in between the two crabs, so that's obviously the little crab and that big crab, um, there's a channel that runs through the middle. And on your eastern side, just north of the little crab, that big basin type area there, um, really good on the last hour of the run out. Um, I don't fish it on the run in at all because I think it floods the banks to it kind of plateaus up. It's not real steep so the water gets up there too quick and you can't chase the fish right up. Um, but there's that big basin there and there's weed clumpy and there's always bait in there and it's really good in there too. But the unfortunate thing is that netters do net it a bit but um, it's not a bad spot. It's not a bad spot. It, it, yeah, so you head up, yeah. so you head up anywhere here or up this way, and it's um, just start to come in tide or run out tide doesn't matter, and you see lots of seagrass cut up in the water, and they're not dugongs, it's not many netters have netted the area, so it will be really quiet no matter how good this, that spot was for a few days. Yeah. Um, obviously, the catfish will go past with their heads chopped off. Um, that's the netters have been in the area. Yeah, so. Um, and they tend to really do it before the Friday Classic, <laughs> everywhere. Um, but um, they want their netting, floaties I guess. Well that's it, yeah. But, um, so if you see a lot of that stuff happening, you better drive a bit further, try and find those. Okay? Rather than flogging it because it's really hard fishing. Any questions on that at all, guys? So telltale signs, see the seagrass, like you don't even try to cast, like just don't waste your time. Most uh, times, most yeah. times, yeah. It could have come from I always give a, a couple of k's away, still have a go, you never but know. where yeah. it's from, yeah. yeah. Like you give it 10 minutes, no. I normally give each spot about 10 or 15, yeah. that's about yeah. it. I won't waste half an hour to spot. Yeah. Drift through, yeah. nothing to move on. Yeah. 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 You'll, you always normally get a fish in the first couple of casts if they're there. Yeah, that's or, a yeah. Hit or, or a hit or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I give it five casts, but I don't get a touch. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You need to know when that time is to move. It's not weed that comes to yes. one Is a bit of spots where they're less stock weed than others? Does it Out of the current, uh, it's funny, it, in the current it, it really drifts through and, and it's a pain in the backside. But in the spots where there's no current, it seems to build up on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 there is no way. No yeah, but, but there are, uh, if you had a lot of northerly winds and big tides, it tends to be really bad. Yeah. If you had southerly winds, it's not too bad. It seems to dissipate somewhere. Or westerly winds. Yeah. yeah. And further south of this, obviously, you've got the Seaway and um, Portuguese Bay and all that top area. That fish is really well as well. Um, mm. I've done heaps of sessions around the seaway and caught a lot of good fish. Throwing like little white plastics up into little sand holes along the rocks and stuff like that. Casting's got to be pretty on point, but um, it's surprising. I can fish nearly drift the whole wall and you're throwing right up into little gaps of rocks. Because of the angle that you fish in, um, you don't get that many snags. And I kind of just fish that first plateau and then once it gets to the top, I'm going to just burn it in and do it again. But I don't lose that much gear. Yeah. And you lose a couple, but you lose a couple anyway. Like there's always a stray crab pot or a tree or whatever. Yeah, so the yeah, see, I find fish in the seaway is you fish the um, right up those little sand patches, might be half the size of the little table here, up amongst the rocks. Do you talk about something that deep on the high tide? A little bit of sand gets amongst the rocks. There's one about every sort of um, maybe 10 metres or 5 metres just pepper cast each one of those and just a little low twitch not too much high um you can drop it down the next ledge and, and then work that but at low tide it's always in the deep edge not up on that country boy rock stuff yeah you find that but. yeah like i'll probably fish the seaway to give you an idea probably the last hour and a half of the run it and as soon as it turns i go and 
like push a bank or something like that. The water just gets a bit dirty there quick. Mm -hmm. And runs away. Yeah. But it's even really good down like near where all the ship pipes come out. Um, that's a really good spot around there. And you just got to look for those like blue holes of clean water. But, yeah. but one thing I will say is that uh, on average, the jumping pin deep water fishes 10 to 1 to the seaway deep water. Like you might get one or two boats and out of fish to see when they get a few fish, but you'll get 30 boats of fish to jump in from the deep water and all get fish. Yeah. So it is better fishing overall. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is in the seaway, try to fish like a jig head with a really light gauge hook, because if you do get stuck and you're using like that heavier stuff, so say an eight pound braid, you can straighten the hook so you get your stuff back and then you just bend it back and keep using it. Because if you use a heavy gauge hook in that stuff, you're just losing gear all the time. Mm. Okay, um, so do you want to play, we've done a couple of videos here, we'll show you, actually we'll do a screenshot thing first, the, uh, is there one there for the slides? So I'll just quickly go through this and Stuart always add some comments to it, and, um, and you can see just some, so you know, if about every probably two fishing trips we'll get generally one fish over 80, okay, on average, and I bet Stuart you're about similar? Every two, two or three fishing trips, you get one over 80? Yeah. Or a high seven. I, I play in more of a numbers game. I'll probably get, I get a couple in the high 70s to 80 a year. But, um, yeah. True. Yeah. But I get lots of fish from like 40 to 70. Yeah. I get both. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell a lot. I'm going to tell a lot. Thanks, so. Thank you. So, if always puts this together, so I'm going to take a second. Always yeah, thank you, Zach, so. for doing a great job. Okay, so, um, so Flady's got big mouths, okay? And that's Stewie said, that hook's got to set in that really hard part here. And it's quite hard to do, but um, when I get a good fish on, I'm very aggressive to hook, set that hook, because I do an all fish. Um, a lot of time, if it's about a 60, they'll come scooting across the top, like surfing on the top of the water, because I've hit them that hard to get them out, to set that hook. I'm a true believer that. I mean, Stuart's seen me surf my white fish. Oh, 100%, yeah. <laughs> but otherwise, the bigger ones, I'll tend to stay down a bit. Yeah. But I, I go hard on them. So go hard on the fish. But remember, it's only six pound braid. Have your drag set right. And I check my drag like every 10 casts or something. Just make sure it's right. Let's grab it. And you heard that that's true. So I go, fish on. I don't need to tick and drag it. <laughs> but that's this common thing I do. Because I don't want to lose that one when I do hook it. Hang on, I've got to make a bigger slide track. And the other side. Uh, and you lead a check. <laughs> Sorry, man. And you lead a check. Every yeah, lead a check. It, every fish that swallows look like I actually cut it and do it again. Yeah, even if uh, you know, like the time is really good. Uh, you know, I take chances. I, yeah. If it feels like a little bit blurry, um, I'll Sorry. maybe okay. have another car, okay. especially if they're on. Oh. And they're on. I think. Well, I'm going to lose one. It's just quick to tie it on again, as to tie it on again. Anyhow, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think flathead talk like some other fish do. If you lose one, they don't go off the bite. They stay on the bite. They keep biting. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what Judy yeah. said. No, they don't talk. Thanks. I, thanks for second. Yeah, I fished a. Um, having said that, I fished a, one of those lagoons up the pin, and me and Michael Green that used to work here, we fished it one day, and we caught 60 flatties between us. <laughs> and we caught probably 30 out of this one hole and in the end we'll catch them under the boat and they already had hook holes in it. Serious? Yeah, we'll catch them the same yeah. fish. Yeah. And 107 is the same fish, like they were fresh holes, so they still had blood around them and it wasn't a hole from yesterday or hours before because we were the only boat in the hole. But um, I think that, yeah, once they get in that feeding frenzy, they don't want mm, they, they eat anything. Yeah. So that's in that Jurassic Park area I was talking about. Or Jurassic Park. That same area again, Jack, with another day, of course. Yeah. Yeah. There's my boys. They've been catching flavour for a long time. Stewie. That's my lady from a couple of weeks ago. That was just a couple of weeks ago, we were out there. No, that was no, on a hard body, actually. Hard body. Yeah. But we cast plastics in the same area. That's at the um, upper Banana Bank area. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> Gold bank. Gold bank, yeah. that'll do, same colour. Yeah. Um, this is in the lagoon. That's the new lagoon. The new lagoon, lagoon yep, yeah, over on Australia. We get them up there in the flats, casting plastics again. So um, sometimes Jack will cast hard bodies, but 
generally speaking, we're always casting uh, soft plastics. I'm not a big fan of hard bodies, but I do do a lot of it. I do catch fish, but um, I tend to always cast soft plastics. And you find the um, bloodies like stay out of, the, out of the fast current, or doesn't it matter? Doesn't matter. They, lo they love fast current too. So you know those big flats up at the pin, on yep. the west of the side, between the not rock and the water river. No, they don't sit there though. One. They don't sit there. It's no. got to have a bit of two things. It's got to have either no flow where bait sits, like in that example, that lagoon. Yeah. They like that type of thing. Um, if it's fast current, it's got to be deep. Doesn't work. Doesn't work on shallow. Yeah. They don't, just don't get them in shallow. Yeah. If you get them up on the edges where it's muddy, and the bait cruises along there for the protection, yeah. they'll just pin them off. Yeah. They'll be there. But on the flats, there's nothing there for them except maybe yabbies. Yeah. I don't really want them. Don't want to be there. They look so much like crocodile, don't they? A little yeah. bit. Um, so it's big males, mouth. massive males, yeah. And the head's very skeletal. It's very hard. They do have the soft little bits here, and that's sometimes the ones that you've got a good fish on that pops out because you've just hooked it in the soft part. But hopefully you get it up in this top part. Here is the best scenario. Okay, so just um, populous ones we like to use. That's those four inch prawns we're talking about. They're very good at me in there's row. So different styles. Sort of my pick, one of the ones. <laughs> jig head, so this is a weedless style jig head we talked about earlier. You can use now, some has spinners on the bottom of them, and some here. Um, but generally speaking, this style of attachment is the best, and football jig heads are the best to use to get the best results, I believe. Um, so that's, I think you've got that one in your bag. That's one of my favorite plastics to use. When I'm fishing sort of anywhere from two to about four meters deep, that color, that one, and that's, I was using the smaller version that the other day, which went around here, and they just, they love that color. It's called, called See the how it's got that flat section at the front too? That's that, um, they always sit up right. Yeah, that's right here, so yep. it's flat. Yeah. yeah, they kind of plane a bit downwards on the sink as well. But you prefer the football heads over that shape? Yes. Uh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, just fluorocarbon. If you want a heavy leader, yeah, 16 pounds, 16 to 20s. 20s where I'd stop at and where I'd definitely what I use in the deeper water or snaggy areas and whatever. Uh, tools, okay, so really important to have some sort of lip grip, whether it be just the cheaper style like this or that style. Um, it's just too hard to grab the flathead in the mouth. Even a little one that big, you put your finger in the mouth and they shake the head. Those little teeth, they just rip off all your skin on your thumb. And after about 10 fish, it's quite painful. So um, either have yourself a glove, but I've got time to put a glove on and glove off. So lip grip straight in the mouth, get the hook out, they'll let the fish go, you throw it in the esky. I've still got scars from my last one. Have you? <laughs> yeah, I, I we use lip grips a lot so these days, so it's easy and quick. Um, hook out gun, exceptionally good, particularly if you're using hard bodies and stuff, but um, hook out guns, um, there's one here, it's a cheaper one, but um, that's that thing there. So what happens is, the, if it's right down the throat, wherever it might be, you just hook onto the hook part in here, and you just grab it and um, pull on the trigger, this thing here, and it just, just you just dislodge it and pull it out. It's really quick. Scissors, don't get, you know, get yourself a braces that cut. Most of ours do cut, um, but they only last about two months in a turf, but they're only 10 bucks, so you throw it off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we can set a good pair of braces. Uh, S Factor, okay. Um, if I'm not using gulp, I'm using S Factor. It's as simple as that. Years ago, we didn't have S Factor and we still got lots of fish, but I think get a lot more fish if you're using S Factor. If you use the gulp, why aren't you using Berkley in the sink? That's a good question. You know, um, I have tried it uh, on my normal plastics. I, I didn't try it till maybe six months after I came back, so I didn't want to try it. <laughs> Um, on my normal plastics. You obviously wouldn't put it on your gulp because the gulp's already yeah. pre sanded And if you want to get a bit of a gulp charge, just chuck it back in the packet for a couple of minutes and soak it up and throw it back out again. Um, but um, the, the gulp version of this 
on my normal plastics doesn't work as good as the S-Factor? That is a really good question because Gulf theoretically is my go-to, right, over the S-Factor. But I think the biggest... Uh, it, the it's the S-Factor. The Gulf stuff's too just, liquidy. Yeah, it's it a bit of liquidy. Stick, yeah. Whereas this stuff sticks. It's it like sticks. So it, yeah, even after yeah. like six or eight cars, so so we change like every six or ten cars, but you go to put it on, but it really feels like it's on there. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, last. Yeah. Nah. You, nah. yeah, if you forget to put the spread on the sandwiches, <laughs> it gets like gritty too. It is quite yeah, gritty, yeah, it's like <laughs> having sand. Yeah, it's, it's not great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, netting a fish is really important to understand how to net a fish. So, um, I'll show you the lights on, we'll come back to this, but it's really important to leave the fish into the net and don't try and chase it with the net. So many people lose fish chasing with the net. I mean, lots. And, uh, and it's the, not very often you get a big one, when you do get it, you want to get in the boat. Um, Stu the other day just did a scoop up because we had a net that was about this deep, I grabbed the wrong net. And uh, we got it wasn't good. It's it was like 80, there, 84 centimetres. Yeah. Yeah. In a net that holds like about a 50 centimetres, really stretched. Yeah. And now uh, we've got it in the boat. I've done that a few times. That's it, yeah. obviously. The fish so in the net. Let, let, yeah. let the head in and then scoop it straight into the boat. You've got to be quick, all in one go. It's like gapping a fish, sort of thing. Um, yeah, so this is why we use heavier leader, guys. So um, that fish, I don't know, it's probably around about 60 centimetres, but um, that lures right down its throat and um, the teeth, and unfortunately I've got the behind here, but the teeth, they're about that, are like sort of 10 or 15 mil down inside its mouth on the average fish. On a big fish, it's 30 mil down its mouth. And there's some in here, but they're only on the top. And your line's always in that area because it's about that wide in their mouth as well. So when you're fighting the fish, it's forever rubbing on those teeth. And they're like, they're like pin teeth that pinch the bait down, I guess. Um, so that's where you're going to have a leader. And all those bigger fish, I'd have to say I have not caught many fish over 70, even that are, are hooked up around this area. It's always down the throat. Okay. Depending on the size of the lure. Depending on the size of the lure, that's true. Yeah. Exactly right. That is true. Uh, that's Dean. I know Dean worked a few years ago. Um, he's like about 6'10". <laughs> so that fish looks like it's about 80 centimetres, but it's probably about 90-something. Yeah, I think it was 96. 96, was it? Yeah. It's a big fish. Yeah. Um, again, we keep emphasising how heavy the mouth is. That's why they take those big glide baits and, and um, other lures. Um, I think that one there was close to a metre. It's one of, one of our customers fishing down south, though. And the next one is over a metre. It's not around, quarter around here though, but they get a place out down at St. George's Basin down in uh, Sydney. Um, well, south of Sydney, it's like the honey hole for the biggest flat in Australia. And like 1.2 metres down there is common. And then about 14 kilos or something. But the head's like about 45 centimetres across. They're just huge, eh? Um, yeah. There's Lockie, Lockie works here as well. Lockie's a good fisherman too. So Lockie's fishing. But so first time ever for me, my boys, I fished my boys since they little babies all the way through in the Flatter Classic. Before they used to fish competitively with the Flatter Classic, but then with the boys, it was more of a teaching thing. And then I was an umpire, because so they'd be fighting in the front deck all the time. <laughs> uh, referee, sorry. <laughs> uh, but Liam's got his own, bought his own tinny and going his own way this year. So that's actually Liam's tinny there, I think. Oh, is that, no, it's Jason's tinny, sorry. Um, so, um, Lockie and Liam and one of Liam's mates are fishing in the photo for the first time as their own. So, I've inherited as a steward. <laughs> and Jack, I oh, saw so Jack's fishing with us. My son Jack's so fishing with um, Yeah, so flatties are beautiful fish, as you can see. You know, they're, they're just a great thing. And as I said, it's just a lucky dip. That big or that big, doesn't matter. Every cast, you just don't know. And every area you fish, doesn't matter if it's the flats, the deep, or against weed, or whatever, they're mixed in there. They're always mixed in there in size. The big girls have the little ones around it. The little ones are the males, the big ones are the females. And she might have 10 little ones around it. So you think to yourself, okay, I've just caught 20 and around 35 to 45 centimetres. There's got to be a big one there. And generally, you might get that big one. Pretty close to it. Are they around just for a couple of months back? The big, uh, the big ones, they come out of the rivers and creeks and meet around the seaway and jump in to do their thing on the moons. So we both believe the next moon, which is next 
week after next, I guess. I reckon that'll be the one. Yeah, because the little ones are already stacked up in the deep. Yeah. I didn't get many big ones the other day, and my mates never got many big ones. They got one, Darren got one about 80 something, and the other guys got one about 70 or 67, but a lot of sort of uh, 38 to 50 centimeter ones, which are little males. So the females are going to rock up, they're waiting. So, and it always tends to be around a moon. So, um, but the tides are big, and you have to go to certain areas. You can fish at the tide, and then the, um, once it starts ripping, you got to go somewhere else and come back and fish on the low or the high. But they'll be there. So next two weeks away is when you guys want to really go hard on it. Any video there, Stu? Uh, no. So it's taking a bit of a long time, guys, but we'll just uh, watch this little video. It's just sort of roughly what we do. Um, let's give it a seasick uh, here. Whoop, there we go. I thought I was falling. Um, Stuart's sort of filming here. Yeah. yeah. So this is Stewie's boat. Stewie's got a polycraft. Yeah. Nice big open boat, plenty of platform. We've got the electric on. You can't hear the sound, but we're fishing along Kalinga Bank out of the green zone, we'd say. Yeah. Um, I've got. Can you see the little bit of gooey stuff on there? That's actually X, S Factor on there already, if I've been casting. That's on a um, 3 8 ounce thing. You can see how Stewie does his twitching here. That's just that little prong. And we did pull a few from there. Okay, should be sitting down here. <laughs> Vertigo. <laughs> You got a head cam on. Yeah, I have. It's it's really hard. Like I tried to tune in my mobile. I couldn't do it the other day. Normally done straight away. I could see which position it's at, but I couldn't see the other day. So it's blind. I was blind. Look. See, I'm turning the handle. See, it does that? Yeah. It's pulling it forward. Is that the coffee grinder? That's sure the, is. Uh, no, that's, no actually, that's actually a new one. That's Liam's rod. Yeah. I stole. Sorry, Liam. I stole your rod, mate. The other day because it didn't make any noise. It didn't want to make any noise. I was too embarrassed. And mine were all in getting service, that was good. So casting right up to the edge of the trees, a bait hangs around trees, remember that. On the high tide, cast right up amongst the mangroves. Even if there's mangrove roots there or whatever, just take the chance. It's a fairly long video, this one's too. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, very clear. Really so this clear. is close to high tide. Yep. This is about two o'clock in the afternoon. But see how that clear part that's there and it drops off just here? So we'll do up on the high tide, they're up on the top here. They're just cruising around, feeding on bait. As soon as that tide starts to run out, they then drop off into that next ledge and then you'll cast up onto the edge, but you'll drop it straight down into the edge and then work the edge. Like in a day, you've got to learn to cast, see how accurate that is, you've got to learn to cast right in there. And it's really important that you do that. It's a bit like barrow money fishing. <laughs> you've got to get right in that little corner. And it just takes practice, guys. Just keep practicing, practicing. Because the last thing you want to do is you might throw up the mangrove roots and scare the flooded away getting it out of the mangrove root. <coughs> when we fish in the comp, we um, we just snap off because we have not time to go and get it. And you don't want to scare the fish, and our, and same with our um, our landing nets our nets. Um, we don't have time to get the the lures out, so we just cut the jig head off and stuck in the net. And by the end of the day, it's like a Christmas tree. <laughs> and then at night we'll go through and dig them all out again. Um, give another net. Is it a rat? Five pointer. Yeah, five pointer. Oh. Uh, Two and a half. Stu, you said he wouldn't nice take that video. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, all day, all this serious, all day you'll see Stuart's fish at the moment. Yeah. They're like lots of 40s and 50s, and I was getting them too, of course. Uh, and that's why you get a little one off too. If you grab the jig head and just flick it like that, they'll generally pop off. Otherwise, they're going to stab you. How, how old would a flathead be of that size? 
Um, I don't know about flat egg grows actually. <laughs> they um, reckon, I think they've done a study in St George's Basin and a 93 centimetre one they reckon is about 13 years. Yeah. So they're pretty fast growing. A lot different to brim. Yeah, brim. Yeah. Brim slow growers. Brim slow growers, yeah. yeah. Brim very slow, so I'm a snapper too, I think. We might just uh, yeah, I think the, the, this yeah, yeah, go to the next one. Seeing how they've been uh, <coughs> doing in the hatchery, they're saying they have to get rid of them at like eight weeks old because they start eating each other. Oh, is that right, eh? Yeah, wow. Well, they lose half their This one isn't flush out. Yeah, eight weeks each other. That's incredible. No, that one's okay. Hey? Think about that one. You want that one? Yeah. <laughs> just want to see, show you. You didn't want to show on the spot. Hey, nah, that's alright. That's up in Jurassic Park. <laughs> yeah. It's on Jurassic Park too, down, down the runway we are here. I don't even catch any fish, but just see the action. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, it's different technique. My kids do it really well. I'm really proud of them too. The thing I like about it is when you get the, the when they t when they hit it, it's already tight, so you don't yeah. ever they don't drop them. You know, really drop them. I find it's good to take the slack out of the belly as well. Yeah, that's really always, that's right. Me. Yeah, so when it's windy and stuff like that, it's really good because it's always tight yeah. and in contact with the lure. So you see, um, the water here is about, what, about six foot deep, Stuart? Eight foot deep? Yeah, about it? six probably. Yeah, yeah. So lifting up fairly high, but the last part, like Stuart does the same too, he's, he quite often the holes that end bit up a bit, and I do too. So you really not actually lift up any high, you're just pulling it towards you, so to speak. And uh, that sort of helps. Do you keep that same technique through the whole session? 100%. Yeah. Because it just works for me. I don't know. I've been doing it ever since I could remember. Only for flathead. <laughs> Only for flathead. So we're just naturally here that's a bit of snot weed. But check your line all the time. Even a little bit on your knots is not good, you know. Um, you talk about current flow. Yes. In here. Yes. You cast one way, you cast the opposite way. Yeah, so example here was on that particular day, um, there were, the wind was blowing from northeast, so we're casting with the wings, but it was actually really, it was high tide, so there was no current. It was, no it was just wind drift. So always, in that scenario, you cast with the wind because it's just easy. Not against it, you get tip wrapped. Sorry. Still is, is there another video of a sniper or not? Stewie's actually positioned me into the wind there yeah. so I get wind knots. <laughs> and, t and tip wrapped. Classic speed shot. Yeah, total. Total. Yeah. But you did steal the front of your boat. That is true. That is true. Well, actually, he gave me yeah, just my birthday, yes, so he said you can have the front of the boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the day I was going to get done. Yeah, that's right. So Stewie, so that, see it's got a bit of weed on it, so it's still got hit. Yeah. Okay. Or it's gone through the weed or something. Maybe. Like, there's a bit of weed on it. Yeah. So Stewie's grabbed the leader here. I wouldn't normally do this. So this is about... I'll lift anything to 60 centimetres. I don't worry about that. Because they tangle up in the net and it takes more effort. And if you are going to lift fish, use grab the leader. Don't use your rod because we see heaps of broken rods. Mm. People high stick in or can't fish hanging the off rod. the end. And, yeah. So I said, Stu, that's about 56 to 58. So we measured and it was 57. I think. 57. <laughs> pretty high. Yeah. So loop grip straight in. Are you, you said 
glide. So I guess it's given us statistics. No, that one doesn't glide. That one actually flicks. So that's the um, the one that glides is the the gulp style. There's a new one coming out from Berkeley that's even better. Um, but it should be here maybe tomorrow or next week. I'm not here yet. Fifty-eight. Anyhow, um, so they glide, but the, the easy shrimp flicks. So when he flicks, it flicks as well. It moves, it's articulated at the back. Um, sorry guys, I'm blocking the view here. So this fish was on one of the little fused ones, like what you got in your bag, just with that little medlock head. Lot slower retrieve. I'll just pass when it's around while, while we're doing this, you can feel how it works. And you've got that in your bag, it's a very, very, very good colour and a very good lure in clear and dirty water. Do we use any of those holts? Uh, the holts prawns, I haven't. Um, I think actually, yeah, I think a couple of guys, um, I think Lockie used these. Yeah, I'm but not not flash. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, they're pretty pretty boring, but they, they work well on brim. But um, floaties are not too bad. But I I'd, 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 I'd reckon I'd fish any day with the gold yeah. or uh, something else. Like mm. Yeah, they're well publicised. So see how much that is hailed in that one. So the average fish there was around 50 centimetres, or 60 maybe, 60 something. 40 something. Uh, about 48 maybe that one, but yeah. Yeah. So guys, we've got the So I've just had three casts of lots of flatties on this one here. Now I'm minging, so I've had three, I've got three casts, two flatties, but Stewie's pictured, I'm doing all Stewie, but he won't do me. <laughs> so you wouldn't fish up in the... Against those mangroves there on the top? No, they're around the weed clump speeding out the paddock on the high tide. Yeah. They'll work against the edges too, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, but they're more out in the middle. They're in that area, yeah. That's it, thanks, Drew. Yeah. Thanks for second. Good job. Okay, so um, any questions on that at all, folks? What about the night time? Uh, okay, flatties, I, I think they're, they're, they're blind. So unless you cast a lure next to them, um, they don't they don't see anything. They will you will catch them around lights on jetties and bridges and that at night time, yeah. or uh, stuff like that. But you won't catch them out of out the open paddock at night time unless it's a, a lost fish or a half breed or something. Yeah, they sleep behind yeah. the bury themselves and sleep. Oh, true. Yeah. At, around lights or just night? No, 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 no black. No, 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 no. Yeah, right. Yeah. I get, I, I get around the bed at night so I'm chasing the jewel as well. Like do you? Yeah. I, yeah, I don't bait fish much at night, so that's maybe why. For the bigger baits, I thought you Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 But the ones you get at night time are always big, they're never little ones, they're not rats. Yeah. Okay, so um, so you understand all the gear, all this is good. Are there any questions at all, folks? Anything on the ladies, on the plastics? I want to touch on the night time thing. Yep. Um, like the UV style rules, you can hear much in the day and they glow throughout the night. Yep. Would that be quiet? Um, it may be worth a try. I've never done that. Like no, if you, I haven't tried This it. one here. It um, seems a little gimmicky to me, but I've never sort of done it. Unless you've yeah. set it up sometimes. I always think it's too bright. I'm never giving it a little bit. Yeah, we're going to bring a UV torch up to show you guys how much this is, some of the stuff is UV, you know. Yeah. Um, but a lot of these colours are um, uh, all the Lumo. Old, yeah, all the old proven favourites, like because no one ever knew about black light and UV light and all that type of thing. But since that came out, you get a torch and you zap them, and they just light up nothing, you know. Yeah. Um, I'll just grab a couple here. There's been something still there, just gone. Um, I'll just charge these up for one sec on this light here. It's not the brightest of lights. Matt, if you don't mind us to turn that light switch off for a sec, buddy, see how good they are. Is that glowing? Oh, I've got to turn this light off too. Sorry. Uh, something down here. Sorry, Paul. Cheers, mate. I think mate, one of the ones here is take it, take it. 
That's it, right? Yeah. Oh, the light's there, son. So it's true. <laughs> They've probably run out of light by now. <laughs> <laughs> Are those running? Won't turn off? No. It's got to cool down. Yeah, just put your hand in there. But can you see, can you see that at all? Yeah. yeah. So if you were to do that at night time and there's bait in the area, I dare say, yeah, we hit that, only got that top part of that one there, but you can see that there. But they'll definitely glow, yeah. If you hit up the UV torch, it's like pumper straight on, you know. Thanks, Matty. Thanks. That's the good Thanks, thing Paul. about they got glow blue. Blue glows way better than yeah. green glow or pink yeah, glow so or any of that. They glow blue. It's not green, it's blue, as you yeah. said. You know? Yeah. But, um, yeah, give it a shot, mate, maybe. Yeah, haven't tried it. And How do you get on with flies as opposed to soft plastics? Yeah, so we didn't talk about vibes. That was the last thing. Lucky you reminded me, mate. And, and also for the gentleman at the back there, um, if you're land based and if you're swimming out for a flatty flick, like a lot of our customers have a rod in the car, they'll fish out boats, but when they have the opportunity after work or whatever, they zip down to the front end, have a cast. And um, the biggest area to fish is generally from Bayview Harbour all the way down to Paralyse Point, um, along that foreshore, particularly where the canals come out. At low tide, really good fishing. You've got big weed beds that you can actually cast to the outside edge of the weed bed and, um, and worked at the deep edge as well. First to run in, last to run out. Um, high tide, these will be high tide early morning. The next couple of days is really good for fishing in that area, mate. Uh, they'll, they'll be right up on the edge of the sand. And you don't want to cast out too far, except for maybe the canal entrance, but thanks, mate. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. Thank you very much. Um, so you'll need to cast, like, if you, this is the shoreline on that way, like that, instead of casting like that, you want to cast down that angle there and hop it quite a long way back towards your enclose. Because I'll be feeding up and down along that shallow part, 100%. Once the tide starts running out a bit, and it drains down a bit, then they'll fall off to the weed edge. Then once it gets a little low, they'll fall over the other side of the weed edge. And that's where they'll be in the deeper where it drops off. Yeah, and that's the general thinking for all fishing out of the boat off the shore, and that's how they how they feed their progression. Oh, the same too? Yeah, I think it's the same. And the other yeah. like really good land-based spots around Jabiru Island. That type of area out near the um, yeah. eagles nest out near the end. It's oh, quite yeah. good. It's a yeah. little weedy, like motley bottom. Yeah, so you're facing yeah, back, facing back towards um, Hobart. Yeah. yeah. On that edge there. Yeah, yeah. really good. Yeah. Um, you can also get them up around Tarana Street. It's not too bad. And that little island there, mate. There's yeah. a good flatties there. The first to run in, they'll come in into that behind the island there. That's a good area as well. Um, yeah. Possibly, like, you'll get them uh, maybe All those around. Dead end canals and stuff around the rocks. They'll sit on yeah. where the rocks meet the sand. They're, they're a bit of an everywhere. But yeah, they're Gold Coast Bridge. Gold Coast Bridge, I'm probably the building in the marina, South Port Marina there, but along that edge there, a lot of guys get big flatties on there as well. Just got to try and find out where the bait is, mate. Bait's yeah. really important too. When you see bait around, pick up in those flats, it's so easy to catch the fish there. They're, they're just feeding, they're just cruising around hiding in the weed, whatever, and they're feeding, and you just pluck them out. And so with your reels, I know you had a bit of a mix of like two and a halfs and one thousands. Um, yeah, I'm a two and a half man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My wife said that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, it, at the end of the day, um, if you go four, it's a bit big. If you go one thousand, it doesn't cast as far in the retrieve, it's not as quick. So. Uh, the two and a half is just that happy, good casting distance and the power to retrieve at the right speed. So um, I suggest 1500 at the smallest, really good size for trolling though. Um, especially if you use really, really light sticks um, to maybe a 3000. A lot of guys do use like a 4000 in the deep on a bit shorter rod. Some guys use quite short, stiff, aggressive rods in the deep. Uh, and they're fishing very heavy, they're fishing 20 pound braid. and. 30 or 20 pound leader um, and they want it quite stiff because they, they don't want the tip to bend too much they just want to make that plastic dance um, but both Stuart and I don't go to that extreme on our deep water fishing but there's guys that that's all they do is they deep fish so they, a few of the guys now are trans, transitioning into casting hard baits <laughs> and soft plastics up on the flats 
of course I've had to because some years that it's not on the Bible in the, in the comps, comps and stuff like that so that they're learning to do other stuff but yeah that's the size of yeah and the hole hits the line like you still got the backing on with 150 meters or most of the holes 300 meters or 10 pound right vibes so how many guys used vibes before okay so um, vibes are uh, very productive and very easy to hook the fish up and when they're on they don't fall off you've got two hooks that are very sharp and they generally are hooked up across the mouth sometimes I'll take it down right down inhale it uh, but the hookup rate's very good um, the beauty about vibes is you tend to work an area a lot quicker so if you're on a hunt to try and find where the fish are your time of getting that in is a lot quicker than actually getting in the soft plastic so you can do your five casts in half the time to do bigger soft plastics so um, as Stuart says yes four rods I always have four rods with me I've got my kids with me it's like got rods everywhere but um, we always have one the soft vibe on it like that style some Archie vibes, I believe, are the best vibes you can get. Um, they, and they're a bit cheaper than Trans Ams and other high-end vibes. Um, but one would, be vibe, one would be rigged up with um, a 3 8 a quarter and a 1 6 That's how I'd sit the progression. If I was going to get this fish to deep, I'd probably only have um, halves, a big vibe, um, half, half ounce and maybe a 3 8 at the smallest end. So in the flats, I'm using like a little vibe like this fellow. And out in the deep, I'm using a bigger one like that. Okay. What would Creed be using the uh, So keeping it, keeping the weight of just a little lift, bro, and then drop it back down, but winding down and just working it all the way back, and keeping in touch with the line the whole time. You're not actually lifting it up and letting it fall back down and then wind the slack up. You don't do that. I have caught fish that way, but it's not the way that you should do it. You should keep in contact with it the whole time. But let it fall to the bottom pretty well. Uh, I'll just pass a couple of these around so you can get the idea of how they are. It's this little white bait one, it's a, one of the ugliest colours, but it just smacks them badly. That's probably... Yeah, it looks horrible. The, the that's pick, probably my colour wise. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, the little fuse ones here, if you're fishing flats and fishing a six pound braid, these little ones here really kick But I think you've got one of those in your bags yeah. too, by the way. Yeah, it's in there, that's the one here. So these ones are really good in the flats in that sort of... A uh, metre to two and a half metres deep and fishing in six pound braid, whatever, and cast it up and just hop it back. Same deal, exactly the same way. But single hook up rate, but it's always in this corner when you hook up. How often do you use the vibe, Doug? Um, uh, what is it? I'll, I'll still use it in the day it's in a certain. It's a confidence thing, though. There's a confidence thing, and um, when it's just not happening in the plastics, before I take off that spot, I just want to throw a vibe over. Sometimes I take the vibe okay. and they, they want something that's more shimmering. And, Quite aggressive working, so then I'll switch just for that cast. Yeah, then if we get one, then I'll. Ah, uh, blades. I used to use years ago, but the, these things kick back on the blades. I believe, yeah. yeah, they do for me. Yeah, yeah, and blades tend to get tangled up a bit too much, and um, yeah. It's all confidence. It is confidence, yeah, and that's so true. Like, like everyone, some of our are very addictive customers, like me. <laughs> Would have ten bags in there underneath all the storage in their boat. <laughs> 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 Irre 